some technical difficulties with the YouTube live stream. Hopefully it is working now. Uh, and uh, well, that's that's about it. I, I would uh, yeah, I would say that uh, the, normally it should be here that we we'll, we should be all be in Prague, but due to the pandemic, this is a situation, and uh, we hope that we will be able to host you on the march on uh, next year. It will be from if you want to note. Uh, to make uh, some uh, note your calendar, it will be from Monday 8th of March till Wednesday 10th of March. 2021. 2021, if everything goes well. So we should start. Uh, I will give the word to Barry to give the first talk. So Barry, please. Okay. Uh, so thank you to everyone for joining us and to especially to uh, Georgios and Wojciech for um, organizing this meeting. Um, just to update everyone, I think the YouTube live stream should be available now, live stream should be available now um, in case there are any problems with accessing Zoom. Uh, you can also access via the YouTube link. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to give uh, a kind of a, a broad introduction to the um, Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit. Let me just uh, uh, share my screen here. Um, okay. So hopefully everyone can see uh, can see that. Uh, if not, please someone let me know. Um, so the, the purpose of this uh, workshop is really to um, spend as much time as possible getting you, you the participants, um, up and running and actually using the tools that are provided as part of the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit. So the majority of uh, the workshop will actually be devoted to um, uh, shorter talks about the tools, but also hands-on elements where you will actually be running the code yourself and doing calculations yourselves. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to give you a big, a big picture overview of what the toolkit is, why, why we created this, um, and what you can use it for. Okay. Um, <clears throat> That's good. Okay, so um, the, this talk is uh, just going to summarize two things, really. First of all, what is black hole perturbation theory, for anyone here who maybe is less familiar with this? Um, and second of all, um, what is black hole perturbation toolkit and how does it allow us to do uh, black hole perturbation theory? Uh, and then at the end, I'll just point towards some future directions that we're hoping for the, the toolkit to go in. Uh, I'll just point out down at the bottom here that there um, is a Slack channel um, for more extended discussions. So if you uh, find particularly interesting one of the tools, uh, you can join this Slack channel. Um, and talk about it there. Uh, hopefully someone from the, someone will also paste this link into the chat so you, you don't have to type it in yourself. Uh, the other place you can ask questions is in the Zoom chat window. Um, so feel free to ask questions there as well. Okay, so what is black hole perturbation theory? Why do we need it? Well, we all, there are many, many reasons why uh, black hole perturbation theory is a very useful tool. Um, Arguably, one of the most compelling at the moment is the fact that in the next decade or so, uh, we're going to have a, a gravitational wave detector, the, uh, the least emission, which is going to be able to, to um, observe a whole host of new types of sources of gravitational waves that we've never been able to see before uh, with LIGO. And in particular, uh, if you look at this, um, uh, this image here, you can see that the kind of uh, the streaks down towards the bottom there correspond to Emery's extreme mass ratio in spirals. Um, and these are a pretty exciting source for LISA, um, particularly because they allow us to really test GR at some of its mo most extreme uh, levels of precision. So these Emery's, if we can model them correctly, will allow us to um, measure the parameters of the Emery and thus measure our understanding of GR to a very high level of precision. So that's one, one really compelling reason why we might, might want to do black hole perturbation theory. 
next question you might ask is, well, okay, seems like something we should be looking at. Um, what is this? Well, essentially, all black hole perturbation theory is, is a method for solving Einstein's equation. In particular, in the case where the, the full space-time metric, G alpha beta, can be approximately written as a background metric, G bar alpha beta, plus small corrections. I label them H1 and H2 here. And there's some small parameter in the model, epsilon. Um, and in the case of those extreme mass ratio in spiral systems, these are systems where you've got a pair of black holes, for example, one which is very massive, uh, capital M, and one which is um, much, much smaller, little m. And they might be in orbit around each other, spiraling inwards, emitting gravitational wave waves during the process. Um, for astrophysical reasons, we've strong reason to expect that, that there's not going to be anything particularly simple about these systems. The two black holes are likely to be spinning. Um, there's no reason to expect the spin vectors to be pointing in the same direction. Um, there's no reason to expect particularly simple circular orbits. Um, these things are going to be highly relativistic. They're going to exist in a very strong field where the two uh, bodies are very close together. So in particular, post-Newtonian theory starts to break down in that region. Um, there's also another tricky part to the problem, which is that there's a very wide separation of length and time scales. You've got the very big black hole um, and the orbits around it. And then you've also got the small black hole. So numerical relativity is not particularly amenable to that sort of problem. And it's a, a huge challenge to try and simulate anything near this, um, near an, an Emory with numerical relativity. But the great news is that you have this small parameter, the mass ratio, little m over big M, which might be 10 to the minus six or so for an Emory. And so that makes it ideal for the purposes of uh, doing black hole perturbation theory. And if you go through the analysis and through the calculations, um, the thing that we're really interested in gravitational wave uh, studies is how does the phase of the gravitational wave signal evolve with time? Um, and what you discover is that at order, at leading order, order epsilon to the minus one, there's a con contribution to the phase that comes from the first order dissipative metric perturbation. So that's the part of H1 that is dissipative. At the next from leading order, um, order one, essentially, um, you have three contributions, one from the oscillatory part of the first order dissipative metric perturbation, another from the conservative first order metric perturbation, and a third piece from the second order metric perturbation. And these are much, much harder to compute. And the key observation anyone who enters this field makes pretty quickly is that that first term isn't so bad, although even that on its own for the generic case of you have a Kerr black hole and generic orbits, it's already getting beyond the scope of a, a typical PhD project. And for the purposes of LISA, we're actually going to need both the epsilon to the minus one piece and the epsilon to the zero piece in order to do um, the full data analysis that we'd like to do to really extract the maximum amount of information from the LISA um, uh, detector. Okay, so that's black hole perturbation in a nutshell. Um, another thing that's uh, worth thinking about is how this relates to numerical relativity. So we've seen with LIGO that numerical relativity was really hugely successful. Um, you know, the, the, the very first LIGO detection, uh, the 1509-14 event, um, one of the most beautiful plots was the fact that you had this signal and superimposed on top of it was a, um, a theoretical prediction of the waveform. And that theoretical prediction came from numerical relativity in that particular case. Um, and that came around in 2015, but you have to keep in mind that numerical relativity was being developed for a very long time before that. Um, for a very long time, it was running into um, a huge number of difficulties with stability and just evolving the system at all. Um, then 2005 was when the first big breakthrough came about um, with uh, the first simulations of an, an in spiral and merger that didn't crash. Um, and it was 10 years after that before the um, LIGO made its first detection. And despite the fact that you had those extra 10 years, there wasn't much room um, to spare um, in terms of the models being ready. And they were really only ready just in time for, for that detection. Um, and the key to that success and to, to being able to produce models for uh, 
in that place, case, comparable mass binaries um, using numerical relativity was the fact that communities had um, combined efforts uh, and gathered together and produced software collaborations. And there are now uh, a number of very successful numerical relativity software collaborations around the world. So that's where numerical relativity was maybe uh, 10 to 20 years um, ahead of black hole perturbation theory. Well, in terms of black hole perturbation theory, where do we stand? Um, we're actually hoping to have the first post adiabatic waveform this year, so 2020. Um, so that's kind of comparable to the, to the 2005 in numerical relativity. This is the first time where we'll have a waveform that has all of those pieces that I mentioned in the phase. Um, Lisa is somewhere in around 10 to 15 years from here, from now. Um, and we're going to need to gear up to get our models ready for that. And just like with numerical relativity, although we're expecting the first waveform this year, it's going to be for the very simplest possible case, a quasi-circular orbit in Schwarzschild with no spins, no precession, no eccentricity, none of the extra things that make um, life really, really difficult. And so we're going to need to work very hard over the next 10 to 15 years on getting the models ready for LISA. And just like with numerical relativity, um, the feeling is that to make this really a true success, what we're going to need is successful software collaborations. So that's where the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit uh, enters the field. Um, so let me just read an extract from the website uh, about what the toolkit is. Um, our goal for the toolkit is for less researcher time to be spent writing code and more time spent doing physics. Um, currently, there exist multiple scattered black hole perturbation theory codes developed by a wide array of individuals or groups over a number of decades. Um, these codes typically exist on someone's laptop somewhere, uh, and that's about it. Um, the goal of the project is to gather together all that knowledge and all that code and all that data that has been developed and uh, make it publicly available so that everybody can use it rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, so additionally, we want to provide easy open access to all of the data that's been generated by uh, researchers working in black hole perturbation theory over the years. Uh, this is a community driven effort. Uh, it's led by uh, the three founding institutions here, UCD in Dublin, uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and the MIT Kavli Institute. But the great thing is that many, many other groups and individuals have participated and are continuing to join the efforts. Um, so to highlight this fact, um, we have a, a tracker on the, the website, which you can go to at the URL down the bottom here, which lists the current users in blue, um, the current contributors in orange, and the um, the founding institutions are there in, in red. So you can see it's, it's starting to have global reach and there's a fairly significant number of groups across, certainly across uh, Europe, the US and um, South America starting to use the, the toolkit. Um, even more excitingly, um, we've got now quite a large number of people who've joined us uh, for this meeting. So we've got 111 on the call at the moment. Um, and doing a quick survey of where those people are, um, you can see a map like this, which shows in red all of the countries where we have a registered participant coming from. Um, so you can see we're, we're, we're really spanning a lot of the world here with people. So it's great to see such excitement and enthusiasm um, from people all around the world uh, in, this, in this effort. Um, Another exciting thing that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years is um, not just people expressing an interest in the toolkit, but also actually using it and even contributing back to it. So um, we try to keep track of papers that use the toolkit as much as possible. Um, the last count as of uh, very recently was around 33 uh, papers that have directly, directly acknowledged um, parts of the toolkit as contributing to, the, to that paper. Um, and another exciting statistic is that not just people using the toolkit, but also people contributing. Uh, we're up to about 14 uh, papers, which in some way or another have developed a component of the toolkit. 
so it's great to see that people are really taking interest in this and it's um, uh, they're starting to, to use it and contribute back to it. Okay, so now just onto the toolkit itself. What does it consist of? Well, uh, in terms of the current components, we have two main, main, main parts of the toolkit. One is a set of codes. Uh, the toolkit itself isn't a single monolithic code. It's actually a collection of different codes uh, where we tried as much as possible to make those codes compatible and talk to each other. Um, so far, we've targeted three main languages, mainly because of the interest of the people who have contributed. Uh, so uh, we've quite a few tools built in Mathematica for easy interactive use. Um, there are some more low level codes written in C, C++ or Fortran, where performance is particularly critical. And then uh, a sort of middle ground is are the Python codes, um, which have also been uh, developed. So those are the ones we're targeting because there has been user interest in that. We're, we're not, as a community, picky about the, the, the language um, as long as the tool itself is useful. So if you have a code that you'd like to contribute and it's not in these three languages, that's fine. Um, the most important thing is that the tool is uh, useful to the community, is well documented and well tested and um, that you're happy to contribute. Likewise, most of the code is distributed under either the MIT license or the GPL license. So um, they're, they're all open source, but there are various different licenses. Uh, again, we're not prescriptive on this um, as a community. If you're willing to contribute something which is open source uh, and it's relevant, we're happy to include it. So the other side of the toolkit, as well as the code, is uh, data. And so we've been collating data from a number of sources and um, you can access these via the, the toolkit now. So things like fluxes of energy, um, local invariants that you might compute in the self-force calculation, post-Newtonian series expansions, um, regularization parameters, which are a kind of a tricky technical aspect of um, perturbation theory for emeries. These have all been collected and curated and checked and importantly referenced uh, in various reposit data repositories that the toolkit are providing. Um, and if you use that data, there is also a, typically a very nice um, readme file describing exactly which papers contributed to different parts of that data. Now, most of the data is still limited to the relatively simple cases of you know, circular equatorial orbits. But work is ongoing to develop that and to open up a wider set of data to kind of the, the full set of uh, space of parameters. Um, the, our mechanism for managing data is that we usually try to get it onto a shared drive initially, so something like Google Drive, um, just so that it can be tested, it can be you know, uh, tweaked and finalized. And once the final version of the data is available, it would then be um, published to uh, somewhere like Zenodo, where uh, it, it gets a DOI and it uh, is kept uh, forever. So those are the two, two different components of the toolkit. Uh, let's dig down a little bit more into de the detail of the codes. Um, well, in terms of the Mathematica codes, uh, we have a number of them. We have six of them listed here, um, which are kind of at a reasonably polished level of usability. Um, and you'll see more details on these during various sessions um, in this workshop. So at 12.45 today, so in about 20 minutes, Niels Warburton will kick things off with a demonstration of the spin-weighted spheroidal harmonics package. Um, later today, we'll have um, Seth Hopper uh, introducing general relativity tensors, uh, which is for doing tensor algebra in Mathematica. Um, after that, we have Martin van der Meent talking about uh, the Kerr GD6 package, which does what it says. Um, and then tomorrow, we'll have uh, a presentation by Leanne Durkin on uh, focusing particularly on the Reggie Wheeler package, but also closely related to the Tchaikovsky package for computing solutions to the Reggie Wheeler and Tchaikovsky equations. Um, there is also one package there called Quasium Modes, which we don't have a talk on, but which is also available. Okay, so in terms of those mathematic examples, you'll see lots more and we'll actually do lots more during the, uh, the sessions, but I 
want to give you just a flavor, a one slide flavor for each of them. Uh, so the first one is the spin weighted spheroidal harmonics. Um, these allow you to evaluate the harmonics either numerically or analytically, um, analytically in terms of a series expansion, numerically to arbitrary precision. You can, uh, it has support for both the harmonic and also the eigenvalue. Um, and you can do things like are shown here. You can do a plot of the harmonic um, as a function of the polar angle theta. Um, uh, or you could, on the bottom right there, you can even do 3D plots. It's fast enough that you can achieve that. Okay, and I think Niels will probably bring you through more details on that uh, in a little while. The second package uh, to mention is Cur GD6. So uh, Martin will be talking about this a little bit more later. But the goal here is to allow you to compute all of the properties of bound time-like GD6 in Kerr space-time. Things like the, car the constants of motion, so the energy and the momentum, the Carter constant, the um, frequencies of the orbit, any particular special orbits like the innermost stable circular orbit, the ISCO, the ISO, the separatrix between um, bound orbits and not and even plotting orbital tra trajectories like in the image on the left here. And you can see here that the goal of these Mathematica packages is to make something very simple, user-friendly um, and easy to use. We're not necessarily going for absolute maximum performance or anything like that, but uh, you can see that these examples all fit on a, a short slide. Uh, tomorrow's talk by Leanne Durkin will cover um, the Reggie Wheeler package particularly, but also the, uh, will be followed up by a discussion on the Tchaikovsky package. They both actually share a common core, so they're almost like the same, the same package. Um, and these allow you to easily um, compute solutions of the Reggie Wheeler equation or the Tchaikovsky equation to arbitrary precision again. Um, so here, and even go all the way down, all the way through to computing the flux for the case of say a point particle in orbit around a curved black hole. And you can see that calculation is, is very easy here. It's basically three lines of Mathematica. So again, the idea is to make this easy for, for you as a user to use. Um, and tomorrow in the session following on from Leanne's one, we'll actually work through a more extended example showing how you might do this sort of calculation um, if it wasn't built in already into the toolkit. Uh, so that extended calculation I'll talk about tomorrow, but essentially the toolkit right now has support for the case where you have a point particle around a black hole, a curved black hole. Um, I'm going to lead you, you um, participants through a calculation of um, a slightly more advanced case where you have a spinning body in orbit around a, a short shield black hole. Um, this is a, a something that I and several collaborators spent a long time working on initially. Um, and then once we'd finished the calculation, we went back and used the toolkit to do it. And we were able to reproduce many, many hours of work in an afternoon. So that's really the power of the toolkit is it makes it easy to do research without having to worry about all the nitty gritty details. So there are other Mathematica codes in there, but those are the ones I thought I'd highlight for now. Um, in terms of other codes, uh, we have a number of C, C++, and Fortran codes. So the Emery Kluge suite, uh, there'll be a talk about that tomorrow afternoon. Um, so this is for doing uh, very efficient, producing very efficient waveforms for Emery's, but with some, uh, some approximations introduced that make the waveforms not completely um, achieving the accuracy that we'll need for Lisa. Uh, Scott Hughes will talk about the, his Gremlin code uh, which currently there is the equatorial orbits version of is publicly available and he's working on developing, making the, the more generic version for generic orbits available. Uh, there's a code uh, to do in spirals using near identity transformations called fast self force in spirals. Um, and there is also a code that Peter Diener will talk about tomorrow, uh, self force 20, which is a time domain discontinuous Glurkin code for doing uh, self force calculations. We also have a number of Python or, and SageMath packages. So Scott Field will talk about the Emmy surrogates package, which um, they was uh, the most re recent addition to the toolkit. Talk about that again in a second. 
Um, and we'll also have a talk about the Cur GD6 GW package uh, in a little while today. Um, and last up, we have the QNM package, uh, which will be the last last talk of the day today by Leo Stein. Um, and that one computes quasi normal modes in Python. So just to pick one example, you'll see a lot more details in the individual sessions on each of these codes. Um, the most recent addition to the toolkit is this ME surrogate package. Um, this was created as part of a paper, which you can see the archive number for there. So it was just at the end of last year. Um, and the really exciting thing for us, the toolkit community, was that this paper both used the toolkit, but then also extended the toolkit and made a new package available. So it was kind of the, the ultimate success for the, for the toolkit community was that it's both usable and also people were happy to contribute back. And this package produces a, uh, uh, or has a, contains a surrogate model for extreme mass ratio in spiral waveforms. It's all implemented with, within Python with example notebooks and repository. And uh, Scott will also go through an example. And the data itself is reasonably large, so it's stored on Zenodo. So that's it for the codes. Um, in terms of components, uh, uh, data components, uh, we have a number of repositories, Git repositories, which have data in them. So there is some data for uh, circular orbit self-force quantities, so things like fluxes, but also local variants. Um, there is a repository called Post-Newtonian Self-Force, which Chris Muna will talk about tomorrow, which gathers together all of the various post-Newtonian series that have been produced, um, particularly those relevant to uh, perturbation theory over the years. Um, to save you from having to ever type them in again. And it, the idea is to make them easily accessible. I'll show that again in a second. There's also a repository of uh, regularization parameters. So uh, you don't have to type those in from papers. And there's a set of examples, example mathematical notebooks. And these ones are all stored in GitHub, uh, essentially because they're, they're small and easy to manage. Uh, once we reach larger data sets, we'll make those available on Zenodo. Okay, um, so to pick one of those, the post-Newtonian self-force, Chris will talk more about this tomorrow, but the basic idea is that um, it combines post methods from post-Newtonian theory and self-force to reach very high order post-Newtonian series. So, so things like 22PN are not unheard of in these uh, series. And like with the rest of the toolkit, we tried to make it an easy interface to access all of this data. Um, and so you can see a simple example here. I mentioned uh, data storage. Um, for anyone who wishes to contribute to the toolkit, um, the recommended procedure is that initially maybe you share it on Google Drive. We do have a, a toolkit Google Drive, which we can share with anyone who wants to uh, send us so send the, um, the toolkit data. Um, that's kind of a staging ground where we where people test it and check everything is okay and check the formats are right. And uh, once everything is signed off on and verified, then it gets uploaded to Zenodo, just like with this um, surrogate data. So a few other things uh, which are important to the toolkit. Well, it's great to produce these codes. It's great to make them uh, easy to use, but equally important is making sure that they're working correctly and that they don't have bugs and they're producing correct results. Um, so we've been quite careful about that. Uh, all of the code is hosted on GitHub. So there is a, um, a page for the toolkit on GitHub, which has all of the repositories for all of the various different codes. Um, in fact, even the toolkit website is part of that, uh, one of those GitHub repositories. Um, we have built-in issue trackers. So if you find a bug or have a feature request, you can go onto these um, GitHub pages and file a bug, like one of the ones on the right here. We also have continuous integration testing. So we have unit tests that we run every time any change is made to any of the codes in the toolkit. We have a server which automatically runs a set of tests to check that nothing has been broken, that it's still producing correct and expected results. Um, and that integration, that um, continuous integration is done with Jenkins, uh, a tool for con continuous integration, but it's also hooked in with GitHub. So if you look at the image on the right here, 
um, you, oops, you can see, uh, for example, the lever improvements has a little green tick on it. That green tick is a sign that Jenkins has run all of the unit tests for that piece of code and they've all passed and that means nothing has been broken. There is also a website interface to the Jenkins tool um, at the address below, but we've had to password, password protect that just because of uh, fears of hacking. Um, however, if there are developers or people in the community who wish to access that, they can send us an email and we can give them access. Okay, so we have a lot of people here on the, on the um, meeting. Uh, how do you get involved? So it's great that to have everyone here and learning about the toolkit. Um, this workshop is designed to really get you involved in using, developing, contributing to, and gaining from the toolkit. So the first thing you can do is download and use the code. And there'll be plenty of opportunities to do this over the next few days. Um, the way you do that, and I'll go through this again in a few minutes, uh, is you go to the web page, you click this button here, which says install this package and then it gives you instructions for installing. So here's an example from the Tchaikovsky code. Um, try out the code, run it, use it for your own research. Hopefully it'll all just work, but if there's something you realize which doesn't work, or perhaps something which you think would be great to have, but isn't supported yet, um, it will be great to have you let us know. And the best way to do that is to go on to the GitHub page into the issues here, the issue tracker, and submit a bug report or a feature request or enhancement. Even better for us um, in terms of making our lives easier is if you've already solved the problem yourself or you've already implemented the feature yourself, what you can do is you can submit a pull request so you can upload your own um, changes to GitHub, uh, go into the pull requests, create a pull request um, and someone from the um, the toolkit community will review that. And if everyone is satisfied, it will then be merged in to the toolkit. So that's the most direct way you can get involved. Another way is something everyone here is doing already is to participate in one of these. So this is the first uh, public workshop that we've organized. Um, it's a shame we couldn't all be in Prague at the moment, but great to see so many people attending anyway. Uh, we do have on the plan at least a second workshop for to be held in the US at the ICER meeting in Brown. Uh, that's scheduled for September. Um, and the idea of these workshops is it's not a typical conference where you just sit and listen to talks. We really want to provide training in the tools and give a chance for users, new users to learn about the toolkit and to actually get up and running with it. And also we have on Wednesday this week, we have a developer day where anyone who's interested in contributing to the toolkit or developing parts of the toolkit can join in and discuss um, what they wish to develop. Another way uh, people can be involved, and actually it's a good motivation if you're thinking about contributing something to the toolkit, now is a very good time because we're planning a paper. Um, this is currently in draft. Uh, our aim is to have it out, or at least a, a good draft of it done later in the summer. Uh, and in terms of authorship, the idea is that anyone that has contributed to the toolkit in any way, so has contributed code, will be welcome and invited to be a co-author. Um, and our hope is that then this paper would get cited whenever someone uses the toolkit um, and would be a way for them to acknowledge uh, how the toolkit has helped them. We don't have that paper right now. So in the interim, uh, the best thing you can do if you find the toolkit useful and you want to acknowledge it is to, um, if you look at the toolkit webpage to the explanation of how to, uh, a guideline for how to cite a toolkit, we'd ask you essentially to take this sentence, this work makes use of the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit and put it somewhere in the acknowledgements of your paper. And the reason for that is then we can easily search for that, that sentence, it's fairly unique, and that allows us to keep track of who has found the toolkit useful. Um, and there is also a BibTech entry there, which you can download uh, from the toolkit website. This is very important for us, uh, both in terms of keeping motivated, it's great to see so, such interest, and the more people that use it, the more motivated uh, everyone is to develop the toolkit more. Um, but it also helps us to prioritize areas that are clearly very of high interest to people, 
and particularly to secure funding for these sorts of workshops that we're running right now. In terms of where things are going, um, well, in the near term, we're going to try to write that introductory paper. Uh, we're going to try and get the toolkit out there, run, running these workshops, for example, um, get people using it. Um, we need to make sure we standardize on good data formats that are sensible and long lasting and flexible. Um, so that's something which is quite difficult, takes a lot of discussion to get right. Um, and also up until now, uh, toolkit contrib contrib contributions have been relatively ad hoc. Someone has sent someone else an email and said, I'm interested in doing this. Can I, can I do it? And usually the answer is yes. But as the community is growing, um, it's likely that we'll have to formalize that a little bit more, to put some more formal structures in place. Uh, in the longer term, we want to keep growing the community. Um, one of the motiv motivating factors for uh, me and the, the group at UCD, for, sh for sure, is tackling the second order self force problem, which is a really monumental challenge. Um, so our hope is that by providing some of these tools, people will be incentivized to join that effort. Um, and for example, uh, comp computing in spirals and producing waveforms for Lisa um, are some of the outcomes that you might get from that. Okay, so I think I've talked for long enough uh, about the toolkit. Um, maybe, are there any questions from anyone? I'll just try and see if I can find the chat. Okay, so sorry, I see there are some questions. Um, Okay, so a uh, question from uh, Luis saying about circularized orbits. Um, so for comparable mass binaries, you would expect orbits to circularize, um, but essentially that doesn't happen for Emery's. And I guess Niels has answered that question already, but there are studies that say you could have eccentricities up to about 0.7 for Emery's. Looks like the other questions have already been answered in the chat. Tran plans to translate the mathematical packages to Python. There are some plans to do, um, and it's certainly something we could talk about on Wednesday. Um, okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Niels in just a minute. Before I, before I do that, um, I want to do one more thing, which is to show you how to get the toolkit. Um, and uh, this differs depending on the, the tool that you want to use. Um, so I'm going to show you in particular how to get the Mathematica codes up and running. Um, but there are likewise, the Python tools typically are installed using pip and the, um, the C or Fortran codes have their own installation instructions. But in terms of the Mathematica um, tools, um, you can just go to the website to get these instructions, but actually it's very, very straightforward. I've got a Mathematica window open here, which I'm sharing with everyone. We have set up a server for installing these, a packlet server for installing these tools um, and all you need to do if you're using Mathematica 12.1 is run packlet site register and then the name of the server, which is https colon slash slash packlet server dot bhp. So this command here will um, add our Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit Packlet Server to the list of ones that Mathematica knows about. Um, you can then do Packlet Site Update on that server to download the list of packages that are available.
something like that. So you can update the list of packages that has downloaded that. You only need to do this once. And if the, the first thing here remember, is remembered for all time in Mathematica. This you would do every time you might suspect that there's a new packlet available, a new version of a tool available. And um, this will download the new versions. And then finally, you can do packlet install, say on the Tchaikovsky package, and it will install it. And now that packlet is installed. You can likewise do that with the other packages that are available. We have Reggie Wheeler, we have Cur GD6, we have Spin Weighted Royal Harmonics. Uh, we have general relativity tensors. And last but not least, uh, we have post Newtonian self force. Okay, and that's it. You've now got all of the Mathematica parts of the toolkit installed. I'd encourage everyone on the call here to actually run these commands. Um, if you uh, you can get them from the uh, toolkit website site, if you just go on, go into one of the packages, you get that you get installation instructions, so you can just copy them. They are slightly different for older versions of Mathematica, so go there if you want. The, the names of the commands are slightly different, um, but the procedure is the same. So please have a go at that. Um, try installing these these six packlets, um, and if you have questions, you can either ask on the Zoom chat here or you can go into the Slack channel for kind of more extensive discussions. But with that, I'll leave it here uh, and I'll hand over to Niels Warburton, who is going to do the first hands-on session with the spin-weighted spheroidal harmonics package. Um, so please make sure you have that installed if you want to follow along with that presentation. Thanks, Barry, for that nice introduction. I will get set up here. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about one of the Mathematica packages. Uh, so hopefully you can see uh, my slides there. I'll also open the chat window so I can see if any questions. Great, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, spin weighted spheroidal harmonics, which is one of the Uh, which is one of the um, earliest packages to be introduced into the toolkit. So it's actually one of the most um, robust and well-developed. Um, although I'm talking about it, it obviously has had many contributors, um, myself and Barry, Mark Casals, Sarvak Jai, and Adriot, all just to name a few. Okay, so... As Barry pointed out, you can just install this. Very uh, If you go to the, the website, bhptoolkit.org, uh, go to the toolkit, um, and you should be able to click on spin weighted steroidal harmonics and that will give you instructions and some examples as well of how to use this piece of software. Um, as I say, we recommend you install it via the packlet system. Some of you who've already used the toolkit before may have installed it with, with Git. Uh, we recommend uh, you, you follow a link in there for the developer instructions and kind of remove the Git stuff unless you're actually developing and, and use the packlet installed system, the packlet installed version. Um, if you have any problems installing, um, any of the stuff, then, then probably a good way to ask is in the Slack channel if you have access to Slack or you can ask in the Zoom group and people should be able to help you. Um, once you have it installed or any of the package installed in Mathematica, then you can load the package using the get command, which is, you can write as this double uh, left angle bracket. And then the name of the package, spin weighted spheroidal harmonics. Then notice importantly, you have to have this back tick um, at the end or else it won't work. And assuming the installation has gone correctly, um, you should find that the, the package will just load and produce no, no errors or anything. It just won't say anything. It'll just give you a new line. Once you do that, this package will define four new functions for Mathematica. Um, and if you've got autocomplete enabled, you can just type spin and it'll start completing those four different functions. So those functions are the spin weighted spheroidal spherical harmonic Y, an extension of the standard scalar harmonics to the spin weighted case. There's also the spin weighted spheroidal eigenvalue the spin-weighted spheroidal harmonic S, so computing the eigenfunction, 
Uh, and finally, there's a spin weighted Swidler harmonic guest function. This isn't something you typically call yourself. It's something that one of these functions will produce, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, as always in the, in the toolkit, uh, we strive to have good documentation. Um, and this package is, is reasonably well documented. You can hit F1 on any of these functions or search in the Mathematica Documentation Center uh, and get actual help files in the usual mathematical way that explains how you would use um, the various functions and what their properties are, what their normalizations are, what, what equations they obey, and that sort of stuff. Uh, you can also find a tutorial there, which kind of goes through some of the things that you'll see, um, see here. Um, okay, so where do, just very briefly, where do we encounter spin-weighted swirl harmonics? Well, they, you can find them in, in a few areas of physics, but obviously for us in black hole perturbation theory, one of the main areas it appears in, is in solving the Tchaikovsky equation. So if anyone doesn't know, the Tchaikovsky equation um, describes perturbations, either for scalar fields, such magnetic or gravitational perturbations that occur black hole, which you can write in a very generic way here. This phi s is one of the, it's just saying this is one of the perturbations of spin weight. So spin weight zero is scalar, spin weight one is electromagnetic, and spin weight two, or plus or minus two, is gravitational perturbations. Um, and we typically do a decomposition of that into um, radial and polar and angular pieces in a timepiece. Uh, we can use the symmetries of the background to easily factor out the, the azimuthal dependence. Uh, we'll do a Fourier decomposition as well. And then the two things you're left to solve for that are tricky to solve for is the radial component R and the, the, the theta dependence S. So for solutions to the radial equation, um, that's what people normally call the Tchaikovsky equation or the radial Tchaikovsky equation, um, as Barry mentioned, there'll be talks on this tomorrow, um, the beginning of tomorrow's session, um, led by Leanne Durkin, and then Barry uh, will talk, and then Scott Hughes a bit later in the day, we'll talk about a, a C++ implementation for solving this equation. Um, so I'll leave those talks to discuss that. This talk and this package um, is about solving the spin-weighted Swedel harmonics, which is the, the theta dependence here. And these obey this particular um, equation, the second order differential equation. Uh, and in this equation here, this gamma, um, in the case of a curved black hole, is given by A, the spin on the black hole, times the, the mode frequency omega. Which is often, because these harmonics depend upon that gamma, you'll see them written, and I'll write them in these slides, as S with a theta dependence, and then a, a gamma dependence there as well as a parameter. OK, and so one of the important thing about these uh, harmonics is, as any of you who have worked with any of these sorts of things will know, there is a thousand different conventions out there, so what is ours? Um, so we um, normalize our harmonics in the following way. So we'll generally refer to the harmonic as being the product of S times E to the IM phi. Um, that's the Swedel harmonic. Um, and if you take that and you multiply by its conjugate, uh, then and integrate in the usual way over the two-sphere, then you'll see that this will be zero unless the L and L prime and M and M prime are equal to each other. Okay, so some people choose to do the same thing, but they don't include these um, E to the I and phi's and they get a slightly different normalization differing by a factor of two pi or one over root two pi or something. So this is the normalization that we choose. Um, the other thing to note if you've worked with these is that there are a number of different definitions of what people call the eigenvalue. Um, so here in our equations, we've chosen a particular form for this equation. Uh, the, the harmonic obeys, and we use what is normally called lambda, which is what appears in Tchaikovsky's original papers. Um, but other authors have used um, quantities called A, uh, which is related. Um, I see I haven't given the relation to lambda properly there, but that's, <laughs> I'm missing off one equation. I'll add that to the, the slides I upload later. But there's a relation between these you can find in a, a recent paper by uh, myself, um, Marcus Howells, and uh, Adrian Ottawa, as well in other papers. Um, but just so you know, that's the particular eigenvalue we've chosen. Okay, so before we talk about um, Swedel harmonics, let's briefly talk about the, the simpler limits, the spherical harmonic. So this obviously happens when A equals zero, we have a Schwarzschild space time, we might want to decompose one of these perturbations into a spin uh, weighted basis. Um, the, as I said, the, the Swedel harmonic just becomes the spin weighted spherical harmonic here denoted by the the YLM with an S out front for the spin weight. And these need to be written out explicitly in, in forms like this. And this is basically what the package evaluates internally. Um, but of course, it's tedious to have to put that in your notebook every time. So you can just load the package and, and use that. 
And so what the package does, it defines a spin-weighted uh, sword harmonic Y function. Um, and the arguments in our packages always go S, L, M. So the first argument is, is S, in this case, minus two, L of two, M of two, and then you can put the phi two and phi dependence in. And you can see that that will just evaluate that analytically for you. Um, as, as you might imagine in Mathematica, you can also evaluate numerically just by putting in numerical values for the phi two and phi dependence. Um, and if you just put in just just your machine precision values, then you just get a machine precision number. In general, when we write the Mathematica packages, we try and make it work um, the same way that most functions in Mathematica do, that it works at arbitrary precision. And so if you want to evaluate that harmonic to very high precision, you can um, put in high, if you put in high precision input numbers, you should get a high precision output. So the package will track the, the, the input precision and make all the calculations with that precision and give you the appropriate output. So here I've put 0.5 back to 30 and 0.1 back to 30. Um, and you can see you get a high precision result that comes out. And so I'll point that out a few times as we talk about other, other functions. Um, if you take S equals zero, then the spin weighted harmonics become the usual scalar um, spherical harmonics. And um, they collapse down to this function you might be familiar with Mathematica, just spherical harmonic Y. And so here's just an example um, showing uh, that these things are indeed equal when s equals zero. So you can see I've got s equals zero as the first argument in the spin weighted spherical harmonic, just for the first five L modes. Um, and the eigenvalue also becomes very simple in this case. Um, the lambda just becomes L plus one minus s, s plus one. So that's with the definition that we've chosen. And indeed, in this particular case, you can put in, um, you can use the Swedel eigenvalue function I'll talk about in a moment with arbitrary parameters, SLM, and it'll just return precisely um, that equation. So we'll collapse this down nicely in that, in that limit. Okay, well, spherical harmonics, they're not so hard. The, the tricky part is sphoidal harmonics. So um, but let's talk about those. So the first thing you often want to do is calculate the eigenvalue. Um, and you can do that in the, the package using spin-weighted sphoidal eigenvalue. Uh, we try and make our Names descriptive. Um, again, as I said, the arguments are always SLM and then whatever other parameters are, well, in this case, gamma, the spheroidicity, um, and the number of ways you can interact with this function. So the first um, is you can just evaluate it numerically. So here, an S of two, an L of three, an M of two, and a spheroidicity of 0.1. And because it's a machine position number, Mathematica returns a machine position, position output. Um, but the package um, has been uh, takes a lot of time put into making it work nicely at high precision as well. Um, and you can just just as easily say, I want to compute the same number, um, but to 200 digits of precision. So just a back tick 200 here on the spherodicity. Um, and here I've put a timing on just to show you not, not only does it compute it, it computes it very quickly. So in 40 milliseconds, um, you can compute the, the harmonic to 200 digits if, if you should need that, just to say it's very fast. Um, if you've worked with scalar perturbations before and with Mathematica, you may have discovered that Mathematica does already have a sphoidal eigenvalue function. Um, this is just for the spin weight zero case. It doesn't do the spin weighted case. Um, and here I'm just showing a little block of code that shows these two things equivalent, but they don't have exactly the same arguments. So our definition of the spheroidicity is slightly different from Mathematica's and our definition of the eigenvalue is also slightly different as well. So if you choose spin weight zero and then LM gamma as the arguments, then that's equivalent to the Mathematica's sphoidal eigenvalue with LM and then I times gamma minus two M gamma. So that's the relation between those two and you can see you get the same number there. So just in case you're wanting to bump up from using this function to this function, that's the translation between the two. Okay, but you can do more than just numerical evaluation um, with these functions. Um, so if you're interested in a perturbative expansion, so this would be useful for doing PN expansions, for instance, you can also do series expansions of the eigenvalue about gamma equals zero um, and about gamma equals infinity. Um, so that's, again, very straightforward. We just overload Mathematica's um, series function uh, or to allow it to interact with this function. Uh, so here we say, well, looking at a sphoidal harmonic, uh, the eigenvalue for s equals two, uh, l equals three, and m equals two. 
and I'll do a series expansion of about gamma equals zero in the first five terms. If you do that, Mathematic will very quickly just return um, the first five terms and you can see plus order gamma to the sixth. Uh, in principle, this will work to arbitrary order, though of course it will get slower as you go to higher and higher orders, but it is actually very efficient already. So this example, I've chosen specific values for L, um, S, uh, and M. Um, but you can actually do it as well for generic um, values of S, L, and M. Uh, so here I'm just showing the, the first uh, two terms in that expansion, because uh, it grows very quickly. Um, this will get slow pretty quickly if you try the gamma, uh, try to do an expansion up to, up to order 10 or something, it'll take a little, a little while, uh, certainly order 20, even more. Um, but you can see in this expansion, the leading term is just the the spheroidal, so the spherical harmonic um, eigenvalue plus um, order gamma corrections uh, that appear here, and then the order gamma squared ones. Um, in addition to expanding around, as I said, expanding around gamma equals zero, we also recently introduced the ability to expand around gamma equals infinity. Um, so exactly the same notation, we just switch out uh, the zero for our, our point of expansion put infinity in and then the package will also do this uh, slightly different behavior will kind of sit there for the way it calculates it sits there for a few seconds and then we'll spit out the answer rather than being quick um, but still pretty efficient and useful okay and then just to get as an example um, and something for these one of the exercises uh, I put in the notebook what I've done here is just numerically computed the the values for in this case it's s equals two um, l equals three uh, m equals two for the eigenvalue. I've never made computer a bunch of values. That's what the the green dots are, and then I've plotted the two expansions that you saw on the, saw on the previous slides. So just up to order uh, five um, for the small frequency expansion, the red curve, and the large uh, gamma expansion, uh, the blue curve. And this whole plot it would have taken about two seconds to make, including all the data. So it is very efficient, and that's only going to you know gamma to the five. So these are very nice expansions. Okay, so that was um, the eigenvalue. Uh, what happens if you want to compute the harmonic or the eigenfunction? Um, as I said, we normally think of the harmonic as being the product of these two things, as we're talking about and naming things. This can be computed using, um, as you might guess, spin weighted sweetal harmonic S. Um, and here I'm just giving an example for spin weight minus two, the, the two two mode. Um, the next parameter is gamma, and then there's theta and phi uh, that appear. So if you press question mark on this uh, function, it'll tell you what the parameters are. And you can see here, I've, I've just, just for the sake of it, just put in 40 digits of precision. It quickly computes a 40 digit answer, um, which again, it does in 20 milliseconds or so. Um, so that's, that's, very, that's very nice, it's very fast. Um, but actually there's a, if you wanted to compute many values, so for instance, you want to compute a plot of these and you want to compute it for many different theta and phi values, um, there is a faster method that you should be aware of. Um, that's because when you compute these harmonics, it does a whole bunch of pre-computation and then evaluates that at that specific theta and phi values. So if you're going to compute it at many different values, um, what you want to do is save that pre-computation effectively. You want to cache it. The way that is done is just by calling exactly the same function, but don't put on the theta and phi dependence. Don't put those as arguments, just have the S, L, M, and the gamma dependence. This will then return that, that fourth function I talked about, the spin-weighted sweetal harmonic S function, uh, which has a whole bunch of properties you can look at. Um, so it tells you, you know, what is S and M and gamma are, but also the method that was used to compute it. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then you can evaluate this, this S by giving it theta and phi values. And then it just does a, a quick sum over pre-computed values. And you can see this is much faster taking 0.2 milliseconds and computing the same number. So if you're trying to compute many different values of the harmonic, don't run this function, pre-compute the S and then call it as many different values of theta and phi as you need. I guess that was the numerical evaluation. Um, as, as before, um, you can also do um, series expansions of the harmonic uh, about gamma equals zero. And you can't do about gamma equals infinity in this case, just gamma equals zero. Um, and that'll perform an expansion of the spheroidal harmonic in basically in terms of spherical harmonic. So it does an expansion onto the spherical harmonic basis. So here I'm just doing the first order because it grows rather large um, quite quickly, but you can see the leading order, the, 
is obviously just a spherical harmonic. And then the order gamma term contains uh, spherical harmonics and sometimes their derivatives, although not in this case, and they've been rewritten in terms of plus and minus, L plus and minus one. So you can obviously do that here, as you can see for arbitrary SLM gamma and theta and phi, um, but you can also perform this expansion for obviously for specific values. Um, something to note, um, actually for the developers, this doesn't actually seem to work if you put all the values in specifically, I had to set L to three at the end, um, but in general, it works, it works pretty well. Okay, so I will, well, I do want to have a quick look over a notebook um, to show you some examples, uh, but before I do, just a couple of final points. So if you're interested in what is actually happening under the hood with the calculation methods, and so what we do is we follow the, the methods developed by Falloon uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, this, this, this person wrote a, I think it was a master's thesis uh, on how to compute this, the spherical, the spheroidal harmonics in the scalar case. Um, and that will end up actually being incorporated into Mathematica. It's actually what you use when you compute the, the inbuilt Mathematica commands. Um, and what we do is we use two methods. We use a spherical harmonic expansion and we use levers methods that might be familiar to some of you. Uh, and the, the spherical harmonic expansion involves, as you might imagine, expanding the spheroidal harmonics onto a spherical harmonic basis. And um, this ends up with a large matrix that has to be inverted. Um, and it turns out this is very well suited to machine precision arithmetic, but not so good at extended precision or very high precision. Levers method on the other hand uh, gives you some sort of free term recurrence relation and involves root finding. Um, and with a good initial guess, it is very well suited to extended precision arithmetic. And so what the package does in order to be very efficient is it combines the two. This is what Falloon does and what Mapatica does internally for its S equals zero commands. Um, it uses the spherical harmonic expansion to find a machine precision answer and it kind of polishes that root using um, Levers method. If you're interested, you can actually force Mapatica to pick between the two. So normally the function uses a combination, but there's also this method option. Um, and you can say, I want to use explicitly the spherical expansion method. I want to use explicitly Levers method. But in general, um, unless you have some reason to do this, there's no, you know, don't do it because it's better to use both in combinations as the package has been designed. But if you're developing stuff or interested in a particular method for some reason, then you can force the package to use a particular method. Okay, so before I have a quick look at the, the, the notebook, um, I will just say there are other places you can find spin weighted spherical harmonics in the toolkit. So here I've talked about the Mathematica package, um, but maybe you don't have Mathematica or you prefer to use another tool. Um, well, that's okay because you can compute these things in other ways um, in the toolkit. So the talk that follows mine, um, Eric will talk about um, the Kerji GW package, which is a Sage math package. Um, and that can be used to compute uh, the harmonics as well. Um, I think Leo's quasi normal mode package can also compute the, the spherical soidal harmonics. Um, and likewise, the, the gremlin code, which solves the Tchaikovsky equation also has to compute those, those harmonics in the eigenvalue. Um, and so that's all hidden in there as well if you want to solve it using C++. Um, but I'll leave those, those, those speakers can talk about those uh, later today or tomorrow. Okay, so that's, um, the end of the, of the, the quick presentation. Uh, what I will do now is I'll share this notebook. Uh, let me just find that. So you, as someone posted in the chat, I saw, um, you can find this, um, either on, on the toolkit website, if it's appeared there, or you can find it on the link that was provided on my own website. Um, and this is, this is a notebook that kind of goes over um, some of the some of the things uh, that I talked about in the in the talk. So as I said, um, at the beginning, you load the package in that way. And then it defines these four new functions. And if you just put a question mark in front of a function, it'll tell you the basic syntax for using that function. So here, the spherical harmonic, the eigenvalue, the spheroidal harmonic, and then this this word harmonic function, as I said, you never actually call this, um, but it, you will interact with it uh, sometimes. So if you have any questions about these, you can put them in the chat, but you can also put ask them in the in the Slack channel. There's a special channel there just for each package. Okay, so the spherical harmonics, I won't spend too much time on just to say, you know, these are what the, the things I showed in the talk. You can compute them for arbitrary theta phi or put in numerical values or arbitrary precision, and you can compare those. Um, 
with the S equals zero case that Mathematica has built in. Um, a little more interesting, as I said, is the, is the sphoidal eigenvalue. Um, again, same as just showed in the talk, um, we can evaluate it to machine or arbitrary precision very quickly. Um, I said in the talk, you can evaluate these series expansions very quickly. So I just showed the first few orders in the talk, but you know, it will very quickly evaluate. Right, okay. The arbitrary um, SLM gamma, it takes a little while, but they go up to uh, order gamma to cubed, pretty fast. Um, but if you do it for a specific value, then it tends to be much quicker. Uh, so here. Maybe gamma to the 10 is a little bit much. Rolling there. Five, six, seven. Okay, so there you go. Use it reasonably fast. Likewise, you can do the, the large gamma expansion. See, I think this one's reasonably fast. Um, and then this then just below just shows a little plot showing how I how I created that figure that appeared. There you go, the, the large gamma expansion is finished. Um, and so here I just created, numerically evaluated it, and then I plot uh, made the figure that we saw in the talk. Okay. Um, and yeah, as I say here, this will happens for the S equals zero case and how it relates to Mathematica's inbuilt swiddle. Um, eigenvalue function. Okay. Let's see what we have for the harmonic. Um, so as I talked about um, in terms of computing the harmonic, uh, you can compute it for specific phi to phi values, but if you compute it for many values, then you should compute, should not add phi to phi and this will return a spin weighted for the harmonic S function. So you run that, and you see you get this, this, this function. You can press this plus if you're interested, and that'll give you all of the coefficients that appear in the Lieber's expansion. Um, probably not always interested in that. But then the result of evaluating this S with values of theta and phi is in uh, substantially quicker. So you can see here, and then if I do the ratio of the two, you can see it, it's, you know, roughly 80 times faster to do that than pre-compute each time for each phi to phi value. So this is sufficiently fast enough that you can um, just manipulate it on the fly. So you have just made a quick manipulate um, and I'm just changing the value of gamma in real time. Um, and you can see the red curve is the spheroidal harmonic um, for these particular SLM values. And the blue curve is the spherical harmonic in this case. Um, and we can also make a nice plot. I think this one that Barry showed in his talk. Uh, in this case, now looking at um, the harmonics uh, for, let me see, uh, as a function of gamma. This is this is L equals two. This is all the different m, uh, all the different m's, all the different harmonics, and we can drag this this gamma. There we go. It's actually much quicker when you're not sharing the screen, it seems. Um, and that should all get computed in real time. I guess you can play around with that on your own computer. Um, and you can see the, the, the different harmonics are changing. Uh, and finally, I guess some code you can compute um, the uh, sort of make 3D plots of the different harmonics, in this case, for a bunch of different uh, different values. So again, L equals two, but all the different M values. And you can make this, this nice uh, 3D plot showing all the different harmonics. And again, that's reasonably fast to compute. Um, just, I guess, almost at the end now, just to say, yeah, you can compute uh, these, these expansions, um, as I showed in the talk. Um, and you can do specific values. And one thing I didn't mention is you can take derivatives of the harmonic with respect to the arguments. Um, this will all be done uh, correctly inside the code. Uh, so here I'm taking the, the second derivative. You can take arbitrary number of derivatives 
with respect to theta, for instance. Um, and then I can set theta to a specific value and evaluate the harmonic. And so again, that's, that's all very straightforward. And then just finally to mention, um, as I said, you can force the methods to use the code to use either the spherical expansion or levers method. Um, when you use the, the spherical expansion, it will give you a warning saying that, you know, we attempt to estimate the number of terms of that expansion. But if you're working to high precision in particular, you might want to add more. As you can see, the two numbers you get are not the same. They disagree um, hereafter. Um, and that's because you need to add more terms to the spherical expansion. It doesn't know what to do for high precision numbers designed for doing machine precision uh, in the package normally. Um, it has an extra term called num, extra option called num terms, which you can set as you increase that, that answer will approach the levers uh, method answer. And you can see that it does so um, exponentially, basically, as you add more terms into that series. Uh, so you can play around with that if you're interested in understanding how it works. So I think my time is basically up. Um, I will just finish. I haven't really time to talk about it, but there's a few exercises here if you're interested in just practicing. So you can look at the, the, the notebook, um, but a couple of exercises saying, basically plotting the residual between those series expansions and the numerical um, numerically calculated values. So you could do that uh, about gamma equals zero, uh, expand the eigenvalue up to some order n, then again, two high or five, uh, and then show that the residual by subtracting that away from the numerical goes as order n to the n plus one. So kind of make a check on the code, if you will. Um, you can do the same about expansion of infinity. Um, and if you're interested, you could also try and substitute the harmonic and the eigenvalue back into the angular equation and show that it's satisfied. Um, but this we can talk about this in the coffee break or in the Slack channel um, uh, at any time during the day. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to the next talk. It should be Eric, are you ready? Yes, I am. Hello. Should I share my screen or are you waiting for questions? I think I think you should be. Maybe you need to be does does you need a co-host? I think Eric should be a co-host, so he should be able to click the share screen. The share button. I have host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, it says it does say you're a co-host. When I click on the blue button share, I have mm -hmm. an error message, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Um. Any ideas, organizers? Just looking at it now. I see if this... ask you to start my video. So I start my video. Okay. So this is me. Hello. So this works. I try to share again. No. I cannot share. Uh, uh, we can do it. We can show the slides and just tell us when to change the slide. Uh, but I have more than slides. I have notebooks. Okay. Do, you want to, do you want to try again now? Let's see if that. I, I ah, yes, yes, it seems I can now. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. It seems to work. Great. So, how will... Okay, I will start uh, with the slides first. Okay, do you see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay, so I am going to tell a few words about the KR Geodesic GW package. This is a collaborative work we've done with Alexandre Letiek, Frédéric Vincent, and Niels. Uh, okay. Yes. okay, so this package is actually a SageMath package, uh, which at the moment can compute gravitational waveforms, energy fluxes, and inspiring times for bodies in circular orbits around the Kerr black hole. It, it, there's also a module to compute the signal-to-noise ratio in the LISA detector. 
So of course, this is entirely open source package, which is part of a black hole perturbation toolkit. It's distributed via the Python package index. This means that the installation is pretty easy, it's the standard Python installation with pip, except that it is a top of Sage. So Sage can be viewed as a uh, software a top of Python to do mathematics with Python. So you have first to install Sage, but as soon as you have Sage, it suffice to run Sage minus pip install care geodesic GW. Uh, and it relies on some differential geometry tool which has been developed in Sage through this uh, Sage manifold project. Okay, so I'm going to show you some uh, some notebook now to see some examples. Oh, first, I should mention that uh, for the gravitational waveforms, what is currently implemented in the last version of Care Geodesic GW is only for circular orbits. But I should mention that there is a work under development by Lazarus. Suvetsis uh, from Thessaloniki, who is uh, attending a principal based uh, workshop. And he is working on ma making gravitational waveforms for more general uh, non circular orbits. So, this will be a big, uh, big development in the package. Okay. So, for the time being, for the gravitational waveform, it's only uh, circular orbits. But the package uh, recently has been enhanced in order to compute any kind of uh, geodesics, null or time-like geodesics, and uh, uh, not necessarily uh, circular. This is what I'm going to, to show now. So I will share another screen with the notebook, but if you click on this link, you will go to nbviewerjupiter.org, and you can have a, a passive view of the, of the notebook. And if you click on some, um, well, I will show, uh, later. you can have also an active version. Okay, so let me uh, change the screen. Stop share maybe this one. Okay, I share now uh, the notebook. Okay, do you see my new screen? Yes, we do. Okay, so what you see is a Jupyter notebook, which is running uh, the top of SageMath. Do you see my cursor, by the way? Uh, we do. Uh, with the okay, the Zoom I, window is slightly over the bit of the screen as well. Ah, OK. Yes, I have this window I should. Can I use this window? Okay. That's good. OK. OK, can you read uh, easily uh, what is written on, on the notebook, or should I? Uh, Increase the. It's a good size, I think. I think it's okay. It's I think it's okay. Okay. okay so this is, uh, as I said, in order to run this notebook, one has to install the package with a Sage pip install, and then we can run it like this. First, asking for LaTeX display. Uh, we may ask to to use eight threads to do uh, computation in parallels for some of them. And then uh, we are going to declare um, to choose some value for the spin parameter of a curved black hole. So as an example, I choose 0.998, rapidly rotating curved black hole. And then, uh, so this is all, all that I'm going to show is pure Python syntax uh, with some sage math enhancement, but basically this is Python. So uh, we have to import the package uh, from the package. Uh, we have to import the class krbh to create a care black hole. So we do like this, we pass this parameter R a is a symbolic variable, and A0 will be its uh, concrete numerical value. So we create uh, an object, which is a uh, care space-time in Romanian manifold. Uh, well, it has many, many methods, but OK. Uh, we can discover with a tab key uh, what we can do on this object. We can ask for many, many things, like uh, what is interesting here. We could have a metric, for instance. Uh, you may ask for a metric of this object, and you, you will um, return an object G. We can display it and so on. Uh, we can ask for the event horizon radius, for instance. OK, standard formula. Oh, by the way, uh, the mass parameter is chosen to 1, because here we put pass only A. We don't specify M, so M is set to 1. This is the, the length scale in this. We can substitute to the actual value that we have chosen uh, for A, so we get this value. 
And then uh, we can introduce a chart. So I have my manifold M. I am asking for a boiling quiz coordinate on this manifold. It is written here. And uh, as I said, uh, G is the metric. Uh, we got it by this function and we can display it in the standard uh, boiling quiz coordinate with M equal one and we get this. And we can display other things like, for instance, uh, we can have a view of Christopher symbols display. So it will compute from this uh, metric component. They are not pre-computed. They are now being computed symbolically. Um, takes a while. What takes some time is the simplification of the final results. So here, for instance, this is the Christopher symbols. Okay. And now we are going to compute a geodesic in the care space time uh, by brute force. Actually, what I'm what is implemented in the package of moment is simply the integration, the numerical integration of a geodesic equation. So we don't take into account the specificity of a care space time because in the case of care, of course, we can have a semi-analytic formula or even analytic formula involving elliptic integrals uh, for the geodesic. But the package is not using this, it's using a brute force computation, a numerical computation of, uh, of integration of a geodesic equation. So we start from a point. Uh, so we give a tr theta phi uh, coordinate of a point. And uh, so this will be our initial point. So to create a geodesic from this initial point, we have to specify the range of the affine parameter. And then we can specify either the initial four momentum vector, the initial tangent vector, the four components. This is, you can do this if you want. Or you can specify the four integrals of motions. Uh, mu is the mass of a particle, e is the conserved energy, L the uh, angular momentum about the z axis, and Q is Carter constant. Or you can have a mixture of this, uh, of the components, and uh, provide some of a constant. I will show an example. So here I'm choosing to, to create the geodesic by passing uh, the four constant. So I take my space time, m, uh, I use the function geodesic on it. And as a first argument, I provide uh, the interval. So lambda will vary from 0 to uh, 300 m, sorry. m is the mass of a black hole. p is my initial point, OK? And then I specify that mu, I take the scale, the mass is 1, so it will be a time-like geodesic. The conserved energy will be like this, 0 0.883. Uh, L is like this. This value I, I chosen so that I have a, a bond geodesic. And the Carter constant is this value, OK? And I specify that the numerical uh, value for my care black hole, uh, the spin parameter will be 998. And then this is the name I want to give a LaTeX name and so on. So I'm creating the geodesics. It's not computing here, it's just initializing things. And it's initializing in particular from this data, uh, the uh, initial uh, tangent vector, P, for momentum vector, in boiling quist frame, it tests these components. Okay, if we print the object, you say it's a geodesic. And now we are going to perform the numerical integration by some algorithm, uh, which is a kind of sophisticated runge uh, something like this. Uh, and we provide the step, uh, the, the integration step, and is integrating, this is quite fast. And now, since uh, the integration is performed, we can ask for a plot of this geodesic, and is plotting it. So we have a 3D view here. Do you see my uh, the, the graph view uh, moving when I move the mouse? Yes, we do. OK. So they, as you can see, this is a bond geodesic. And uh, so each geodesic has this method plot. But we can pass various arguments. By default, it is a 3D view. This is Cartesian coordinates constructed uh, from the spherical boiling quiz coordinates in a natural way. But if we ask for other uh, coordinates like this t x uh, y, we will have a space-time view and because we will have t instead of z. So we have the same geodesic, but here, of course, the event horizon now is like a world tube, okay? And the geodesic is spiraling in space-time uh, around this uh, world tube, okay? This is another view. Uh, we can have a plane view if we ask for only two coordinates, x, y, let's say, and increasing the number of plot points. Uh, okay, we have this view, uh, a projection on the equatorial plane of a geodesic. 
And we can have also uh, XZ view like this, tac, uh, and we have this projection of the uh, something which is typical of a time like geodesic in care. Okay. Other functionalities are like this. Uh, the geodesic is considered, considered by SageMath as a curve. So if we ask for a display, it is a curve. So it goes from a real interval, the parameter interval, to uh, the space-time manifold. You can ask the domain, the codomain is the space-time manifold. It means it maps value of lambda to space-time points. For instance, if I'm asking Lee, so Lee is the name of my geodesics of zero. So we take lambda equal to zero and I get a point. And this point is nothing but my initial point, of course. You may recognize here pi over two, uh, the value that I gave r equals six for the initial point of a geodesic. I'm asking the coordinate in the default chart, but uh, an equivalent way of writing this is to let the chart act on, on, the, um, on the point. Uh, remember that BL was declared, what is it? BL was declared here as the chart of wave increased coordinates in the curve space time. And uh, so, uh, what is it? Uh, I had the chart act on the point, and by definition, this gives the coordinates. So, for the finite point, lambda equal 3000, I have these values. I can get the initial momentum vector by this function. Of course, I can check that it belongs to the tangent space on the manifold at the initial point. I can display it in the boiling twist frame by default. It's like this. I can display its components. If I want to get the PT component, for instance, I can ask for it, or the P5 is the number three, like this. Okay. I can check this is a time-like vector by taking the scalar product, the scalar square with respect to the metric G. Uh, so I take the metric at the, the point P, and then I apply it uh, to P naught, okay? And I substitute the value of uh, the spin parameter, and I get minus one, as I should. Uh, I can get also the tangent vector uh, at another point along the geodesic, for instance, for lambda equal 200 m, like this. Uh, it is this. Again, it is in the tangent space. And I can also evaluate, of course, uh, the mass at any point of the geodesic. It should be constant. So at the end point, it's not exactly one because of a numerical error in the integration of a geodesic. Similarly, I can evaluate the energy, the angular momentum, and the Carter constant. Uh, we can check the, con uh, the constancy of this constant by this function check integrals of motion. So here I put lambda, and it will display the difference between this value of lambda, the final value, and the, va the values of uh, integrals of motion for lambda equals zero. So uh, we get a table like this. So from you, we have a value, as we have seen. It's not exactly one. And the relative difference is uh, 10 to minus 5, uh, something. And the same relative error for the other constant here. Of course, if we want to have smaller error, we should decrease the integration step. Uh, here we choose a step which is 10 times smaller, I guess, because the previous one uh, was point Yes, I think it was 0.01, the first one that we chose. Oh, no, it was 0.05. So here we are decreasing by a factor of 5, the time step. And uh, what do we get? Uh, yes, we get this. We have improved uh, the accuracy in the numerical scheme. Okay. okay, just to finish with this notebook, I want to show uh, other ways to initialize a geodesic. So again, we have our initial uh, vector, P0, and we can create a geodesic on the space-time M by passing the various component of, uh, of initial form momentum instead of passing the, the conserved quantity. Uh, so we create another geodesic, which is actually equivalent to the first one. It has the same uh, mass, uh, the same energy, same angular momentum, and same Carter constant. Or, as I said, we can have a mix of things. We can specify the mass of a geodesic with one mu equal one, and then we, we pass the 
space a component of the four momentum like this uh, again we get the same uh, geodesic it is the same uh, tangent vector as we can check here uh, here this is a final example where we pass e and l and pr and p theta and we get uh, an equivalent geodesic it, it has the same initial vector and just to finish with this notebook let me show you an example of null geodesic. So now I'm constructing for this range of affine parameter from zero to 14 M uh, from this point. So R, initial R is 12 M, theta is pi over two, phi is zero. And now I choose mu equals zero. So I have uh, a null geodesic. I choose energy one, L minus six. Um, so negative angular momentum and Carter constant Q equals zero. So I will have a geodesic lying in the equatorial plane. Uh, okay, this is the corresponding initial tangent vector. I'm performing now the numerical integration. Uh, there is a warning because at the end, uh, the error is quite large uh, because it's plunging into the horizon. This is a plot. Um, so you see it has, so the, the spin of a black hole is uh, the trigonometric uh, direction like this. So initially we have a uh, negative angular momentum. Uh, so we have a phi dot, which is negative, but then due to the frame dragging effect, uh, the geodesic finishes by uh, rolling in the, uh, into the black hole in that sense. And we can check uh, close to the end for the integral of motions and we have uh, a small, uh, small difference. Okay, so this is to show you this uh, new functionalities about uh, generic geodesics with care uh, geodesic GW. If there are no questions on this, or I can go to the second part. Uh, okay. I will stop sharing this. I will share now, I will be back to the presentation itself. So the second example that I want to show you is the, <clears throat> gravity, the computation of gravitational radiation from circular orbit. As I said, for a moment, it's limited to circular orbit. This was uh, uh, published in that uh, a and a paper. And again, you have a notebook here. So I will stop the share now. I will go back to the notebook. Do you see the new notebook on the screen? Uh, yeah, yep, we do. Yeah. So again, it starts by importing from the package. Uh, we import KRBH, the KR black hole, and we choose now that A is a point 90. And we pass, in, uh, if you remember the previous notebook, we pass a symbolic variable here. Here we pass the, the precise numerical value when we create the black hole. So we do this. And uh, this is the square radius, for instance, in units of m for this black hole. And uh, we have a function which is called h plus particle, which uh, computes uh, h plus rescaled by r of a mu. So again, mu is the mass of a particle, r is the distance to the observer. Uh, and so we have to choose uh, some position of the observer, so theta is pi over 4 phi is zero and u is a retarded time uh, like this. So we pass all the information and R naught is the, uh, the radius of the orbit, of the circular orbit. Here we choose the i score, for instance. So we get this value of rescale R plus, uh, which uh, we have the same things for uh, H cross, okay. 
Um, and if we want to plot the waveform, uh, we, as a function of the retarded time, we set u min zero and u max is uh, twice uh, the orbital period at via ISCO. Now we can perform a plot. We have this plot, so familiar figure. Uh, so the red curve is for H cross, the blue curve is for H plus, rescaled by R divided by nu uh, as a function of the retarded time in units of the black hole mass. Okay. We can ask for a spectrum. We have a function uh, plot spectrum particle. By the way, maybe uh, many of these functions are called particle because in the package, uh, we have functions for a distribution of particle, a smooth distribution of mass. So the package is also capable to compute for uh, some clump of matter, not only a particle. And so we get the spectrum, we have the various harmonics. Uh, so the dominant is m equal two, of course, but you see you have m equal one, m equal three, m equal four. Uh, and in this case, since we are in theta equal pi over four, they are almost equal h plus and h cross. Okay. Uh, if we go to uh, the observer be lying in the equatorial plane, theta equal pi over two, if we plot the waveform first, first we notice that h cross is identically zero. And we have this uh, form, uh, which is well known since the Weiler for H plus, with many harmonics, as we can see on the spectrum. Uh, we have a plot spectrum here. So we have no H cross, we have only H plus. And you can see uh, the harmonic M equal three is quite large with compared to M equal two. And the decay is pretty slow. So we have a lot of harmonics. Uh, if we do a face on view, uh, theta equals zero. So now we have only the M equal two harmonic. Uh, it means we have perfect uh, sinus, sinusoid here. And indeed, if we check for the spectrum, we get only M equal, M equal two. As I, as I said in the introduction, uh, one specificity of a package is also to have some uh, some functions to compute the signal to noise ratio in the LISA detector. So we have a, a module, Python module, which is called AstroData with some various uh, data in it. So we can compute for precise value of things. For instance, this ratio M over R, because as you noticed here, uh, the um, the amplitude is always rescaled by R divided by mu. So if for R now I take the distance to the galactic center, if and for mu I take one solar mass, then my scaling factor becomes uh, becomes this guy, five ten to minus eighteen. So I'm using this now to I should also specify the mass of the central black hole, Sagittarius A star. Uh, this is the time scale in seconds, 20 seconds, corresponding to the 4 million solar masses of Sagittarius A star. And I can import from the module, the, uh, I can import from the package, sorry, the module LISA detector. And from, in, from the LISA detector, I have a strain sensitivity, which is simply the sensitivity curve. I can plot it, for instance. You will recognize um, the sensitivity curve. And now from this curve, we can compute uh, the signal to noise ratio for given signal. So first I take the PSD, uh, then I import the signal to noise, this function signal to noise for a particle again, because again, the package can compute for a smooth distribution of matter, not only a particle, but here we are focusing on particles. So I set the observation time uh, to be uh, one day, 44, um, 24 hour, hours. And the observer is located at pi 
uh, theta equal pi over four with respect to the rotation axis of, uh, of the central black hole, assuming that A is 0 0.9, and we get uh, such a signal to noise ratio for a solar mass orbiting at the ice core of Sagittarius A star. And you see it's a large signal to noise ratio, 10 to five, uh, but this is a solar mass, it's quite important mass. Uh, and this is in our galaxy, of course, this is quite close. Uh, and we can plot the signal to noise ratio as a function of the uh, orbital radius, assuming that uh, the body is uh, orbiting uh, not at the ice core, but uh, further away, for instance, up to uh, 50m, let's say. So we ask for such a plot. Now it's computing for every, it takes some time because it's computing for every radius to perform the plot. Or it should take just a few seconds. Uh, let me show you maybe something. All, uh, okay, if you go to the package web page, you will see that everything is documented. You can also ask uh, for documentation online like this. Uh, for instance, if you care of this object by a question mark at any time. Ah, okay, but it's computing. Uh, now. Okay, let me show you. If you go to the, uh, for instance, the, in the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit, if you go to the page of Kerjosic GW, here you have all the links. Uh, about the installation, blah, 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 but also about the documentation. Uh, the documentation is here. We have a reference manual. If you click on this, uh, you will go to the COCAC server, which arbors the HTML reference manual. And here you have uh, all these things about the signal processing, for instance, this function that we're looking. Um, uh, this is the Fourier things, uh, detected on the signal to noise ratio should be somewhere. Signal to noise, this type of function that we are computing all the arguments. And you have examples also of use for all these things. So I think now it's, the computation is finished. Yes, now I have my plot. Uh, so again, this is here, the X axis is um, the radius of a spherical orbit in units of M, the mass of Sagittarius A star. And here, this is the signal to noise ratio scale for one solar mass and for one day of observation in NISA. So as we have seen before, when we are close to the ice core, uh, it's around 10 to five, very large, but it is above 10 up to, let's say, uh, 20, uh, 24, um, 24 M in that case. And the last thing is that was this examples of documentation that you can get if you have a quotation mark. And of course, you can get also uh, at any time the Python source code. You type a double quotation mark and you add up with the Python source code with the commands and, and, and the Python code itself. At any time, you can access the, the source code, of course. Um, okay. Uh, how much time do, do I have? It's 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yeah, including questions. Okay, yeah. so I will just finish with the, uh, the presentation itself now. There were actually a couple of questions uh, that appeared mm -hmm. in the chat. Um, somebody asked, what was the numerical method that you're using to integrate the GD6? Ah, okay, good question. Let me show you uh, on the documentation. So I will back, back to the documentation. Okay. So the method which is implemented, so if we go to the documentation, so uh, yes, it was here. So it's not that part. Geodesics in care space time. Again, I will increase it so that you can read. So this is this class care geodesic. 
And here we have a function integrate. This is some examples in the documentation. Again, you have many examples. Uh, integrate. So this is this function. And I use it in the example. I used it with almost no uh, parameter except for step. But you see, you have this parameter method. And by default, it is ODENT. It means by default is using actually a SciPy integration method, which is SciPy integrate ODE uh, which uses, if you want the detail, this is a L soda algorithm of the ODE pack suite. All this is documented, of course, uh, on SciPy. So SciPy is scientific Python, in case you don't know. Uh, it's a Python library with many uh, scientific tools including integration of ordinary differential equations. And so this is quite a, quite a robust and, uh, and fast uh, method and quite accurate. It's better than runge Kuta, for instance, much better. Uh, you can choose runge Kuta if you want. It's available as well. You can choose uh, all these, all the methods which are listed are, uh, are available. From what I checked, uh, this one is among the best. Maybe these ones are good as well, but uh, so this is why it is the default. It's fast, uh, robust, and quite good. Thanks. Uh, there was another question that just came up. Is it possible to use different space times other than the Kerr space time? Yes, uh, in the context of the integrating you can GD6? Do numerical integration in any space time, actually. So th the example I've shown uh, was performed specifically for the KRBH. Uh, so you don't have to pass the metric in all the bad metric. But if you go to the uh, Sage Manifold um, page, you will if you, you still see my screen. Go to the example page. Yes, we do. Uh, here you have examples of uh, geodesics, well, in Schwarzschild, so it's not very different from care, but I guess we have elsewhere. Uh, well, actually, as soon as you have a, a, a semi Riemannian manifold in stage math, you can ask for the computation of a geodesic by the same numerical method that I've shown. So you have a, a function uh, a geodesic uh, on any. Uh, semi Riemannian manifold. So you can compute the geodesic for any kind of manifold by the same numerical method from SciPy that I've shown. Very nice, thanks. And there was one uh, final question someone asked earlier when you looked at the harmonics, how were they calculated? Was it via an FFT or some other method? Uh, they were directly uh, calculated. Uh, no, by UFFT, sorry, no, yes, by UFFT, yes, from the time uh, signal. Yes, because we have a FFT. Uh, again, if I go to the documentation. No, 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 no. Um, just to finish, maybe if you have uh, one more minute or if there is no, no more questions. I can Take show you maybe the last slide. Well, I will show it now. just to show some very basic things. Um, if you want to access to the spin-weighted and spherical or spheroidal harmonics uh, within the package, uh, it's like this. Tag. So you have this function, spin-weighted spherical harmonic, and you can use it um, either with symbolics like this, we, you provide uh, SLM. Uh, again, if you have a doubt about what to provide. It's been weighted. So, spherical harmonic, quotation mark, 
uh, we access to the documentation. So S, L, M, and theta phi in this order. Okay, so here you have S minus two, uh, L four, theta uh, M three. So I get this thing here. Uh, okay, this is another value. Uh, we can ask, instead of symbolic things, uh, we can ask for numerical evaluation uh, like this. We can have, ask arbitrary precision uh, by providing uh, two bits, uh, 200 um, bits like this, and we get this uh, here. And we have a spheroidal. Uh, this works only for the spherical, the arbitrary precision. Spheroidal, unfortunately, this is limited to double precision. Uh, so this is examples here, and this is some plots of a spheroidal for gamma, various value of gammas here. And this is a 3D plot of a spheroidal harmonic again for gamma 0 0.03. So all this is implemented in the package, as well as the amplitude factor, but only for spherical orbits and only for some tabulated value. So this is not really computed by the package itself. This has been um, computed by Niel, Niels and put in some tables and uh, the tables are read by the package. Okay, so this is a brief overview of the package. Again, if you want to, to see more, you can go uh, here, you can access by clicking on, on the notebook that I've shown. You have direct access to this. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you are familiar with this Jupyter notebook, but if you click on, on that uh, here, you go to jupyter.org. This is a passive view of, uh, of a notebook. So you can see what it does. Uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, it's passive except for the, the graphics. You can play with the plots, but otherwise it's passive. But if you want to have an active version, uh, it's possible. You have to click on this button here, execute on binder. Do you see the button? Execute on binder in the top right. And mm -hmm. it's, okay, so if I click on this, I will go to binder with the same notebook, but now it's loading SageMat in an interactive session, which is hosted somewhere. Uh, you, so you don't have to, to have any account or something like this. And now it take, can take some time because he's, uh, he's launching something and, uh, and he's opening a binder page. So it's like you have uh, SageMat installed on your computer. Uh, it opens in your browser and now you can change things. For instance, I could change here the value of a spin. I can do like this. So again, I can run this black, 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 black. Uh, and I have my care space time. Uh, okay, something like this. Uh, okay, this is an example. So it's, this binder is quite nice. It's, sometimes it's slow because it depends on, it's hosted somewhere, but it depends on the load of the, the server, of course. Uh, and you have other examples here about the care space time. If you, again, if you go on the Sage Manifold page, there are many examples uh, about the, the care space time. Here, for instance, you, you can see you have a Walker Penrose killing tensor computation, the principal null directions, okay, on human, uh, okay, Simon Mars tensor of care space time, and New horizon geometry of the extremal care black hole is illustrated in this notebook. So you can see many things about care space time. And, uh, and even here also. I don't know if there are any further questions.
I guess as a reminder, you can ask more questions um, either in the Zoom chat or you can ask them um, during the coffee break. Um, the Zoom, the YouTube channel will be turned off during the coffee break, so feel free to ask questions. They won't be recorded. Um, you can also ask them in the Slack channel, and there's a specific uh, channel for for each package in case you're interested. So, so sorry for that. Uh, we we actually had some technical difficulties, so this entire coffee break will be streamed to YouTube. I'm, okay. I'm sorry for that. It didn't. I, I think we will. <laughs> the second correction to the correction. I think we will be able to pause it. It turns out. So okay. I, I will pause the YouTube stream now. Um, if we're yeah. finished. Hopefully we will. Okay. If you uh, stay at the sage mat level. You define the new metric on the manifold, and then you have to initialize this metric component by component. So you provide uh, by some uh, symbolic formula the value of g00, g01, and so on and so forth. So you can cook your own metric. Thanks. This seems not to work. So. Probably, uh, will, if you tend to end, we will inform you by unmuting. Or uh, if you like, we can uh, just watch the chart. This will be also useful because you can see uh, the questions online directly. Or if you prefer, we can just read it as they as they appear. So maybe I would wait for the end of the talks to read the questions. Yeah, probably it would be better. So you can see the program. We will set five minutes before the end of your uh, uh, presentation to start the questions. So please expect that, for example, the next uh, speaker will end at. Uh, Quarter past uh, three local time, so around ten past three, we'll stop for the question session. Okay. So uh, please, uh, Seth Hopper is the next one. So please, you can start now. So just to mention, the live stream is now back on on YouTube again. Hey everybody, uh, it's really nice to talk to y'all, um, even if we have to be remotely. It's sort of a, a cool thing that I wasn't going to be able to get to Europe, but I am able to get to my dining room. So um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> this package that I've written for Mathematica called General Relativity Tensors. Um, and so I, this is something that I think could be useful if you all are, um, if you're new to doing tensor calculations in Mathematica, if you're an exact expert, I don't think this is going to be for you. Um, but anyway, let me, uh, I'll, I'll jump into it. Feel free to ask questions. There's a uh, channel in Slack um, or here on, on Zoom. So, okay. So um, first of all, uh, let's see. I added a I added a notebook that I'm gonna be working through uh, in in Slack also. Um, okay, so so first of all, uh, I want to say uh, there's a bunch of documentation here. Um, also, um, so Barry and Niels have done uh, great work uh, so that you can install this with using the Packlet um, system uh, directly through your Mathematica notebook. And so that's included in the notebook that I that I showed also, that I shared also. Um, I'm not going to do that right now. I do want to show that there's a bunch of documentation that's built directly into Mathematica. So if you go to uh, Wolfram documentation on the help menu on your Mac or the equivalent thing um, on your PC or Linux machine, uh, then what you go to is you scroll down to the bottom and you look for add-ons and packages. And then within that, uh, there is general relativity tensors or other things that you may have had installed. And if you click documentation, it'll take you to this, uh, this page, which has a bunch of stuff. Uh, the most important the things I think that'll help you the most uh, are probably these tutorials that are down at the bottom. And some of the stuff that I'll go through today is, is built, out of, built out of them. 
this is a work in progress. So, you know, there's some, uh, there's always some bugs and stuff. So feel free to let me know if you run into any. Uh, okay, so uh, with that, I'm gonna just start working through this notebook. Um, and so, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, first off we load this like you do any other uh, Mathematica package, uh, general relativity tensors here and uh, and so uh, the one of the things that, that this is for is for doing calculations. Uh, so you basically you're gonna the first thing you're gonna need to do is define a metric, and oftentimes you're gonna be working with one of the standard metrics that's built in. Uh, I'm sure there are many many other standard metrics that are not built in, but this has uh, built in like the normal black hole metrics that we, that we work with in the, in the usual coordinates. So. Uh, so, for instance, there's short shield and, and Kerr, et cetera. So, uh, I'm going to define a metric here, uh, which I'm going to call GS. And so, this is in a, a tensor uh, object. If I, uh, if you know Mathematica, then uh, you'd call head on this, and so this will be a tensor. Um, so, this has. Um, values that you can access by using uh, down values. So for instance, uh, if you wanted to look at the TT component, you can type uh, TT here and this gives you out gravitational redshift. Uh, the, this uh, expression should look similar if to what you would know if you had used exact. Um, the, we've got a minus sign here to indicate a covariant uh, index versus a contravariant index. So if you uh, if you wanted to, you could put pluses here, or you don't even have to type a plus if you um, if you want to get the indices raised. So okay, now if I want to uh, if I want to see all of the the values of the tensor uh, in short shield in short shield coordinates then uh, you just call tensor values on your metric. And so this spits out the, uh, the metric as you would uh, normally write it here if these are the values. Uh, okay, so what is going on underneath the hood here? So one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this is because I wanted to write something that was uh, relatively transparent uh, about what was happening. Uh, one of the challenges with X Act, I think, if you're jumping in, is there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Um, and so, really, a tensor here in this package is just a, a list of rules fundamentally. So, if I write, if I apply list to my metric, uh, what you see is that this is just a whole bunch of rules. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. You don't really need to know what all these things are, but uh, fundamentally, if you like, if you get to a point where you're like, I don't know what's going on, you can always take this apart and look at the um, things inside. You can use pattern matching to replace things uh, if you need to. Okay, um, so if you once you have your metric, uh, then uh, you can define a tensor on it. Uh, you can also define your own metric, though. So let's go ahead. I'm going to move to the next section here, and I'm going to. Uh, copy some stuff in from the other notebook. And so here is um, here are some uh, some generic form of a of a metric. Now, so this this doesn't do calculations for like in like abstract notation. You have to define something. But note that you know you can still have um, a function like f or g here, which don't have any um, any other limitations besides the fact that you've you've uh, said that you know they're functions of of some uh, coordinates x and y. Now I'm going to define my new metric here using these coordinates. So, um, okay, so I have these values, and so I'm going to go ahead and type this in. So this is going to be g new. Um, if you look at the usage message for two metric, uh, it takes a name, it takes the coordinates that you're going to use, it takes the values, and it takes the possible indices. So here I am giving this a name, new metric, and I'm also giving this a, um, I'm giving this something that it's gonna be formatted as. 
So this is how it will print out as G new, but it can be, that could be anything. That's not what it's stored as under the hood. Um, the coordinates that I'm using here are T, X, and Y. And the values are the ones that I have just defined. And then you can put in a, um, any, um, any possible indices that you want, um, but it's often use, uh, useful to just use built-in indices. So in this case, uh, I'm going to use Latin indices. So lowercase Latin is what this is. And there are other built-in indices like capital Greek or lowercase Greek, et cetera. Um, Seth, could I ask you to make your uh, zoom factor a little bit higher? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Is that better? Thanks. Looks great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So, um, so now I've defined a, a new metric here and I can define tensors that are going to be associated with it. So I'm going to define a tensor T1. Uh, and if we look at the usage message for uh, to tensor, which is how we create tensors, we need the name of our tensor. We need the metric that it's associated with uh, and we need the, uh, the values of the tensor. And if you're going to make it, if it's not going to be just a, a contravariant indices, then you need to give the positions of the indices. So uh, I'm going to say to tensor and I'm going to name this thing new tensor and I'm going to call, it's going to print out as T and it has an associated metric and it has some values here, some, and so I've, these again are just um, symbolic. You could put anything you want to in here. Um, and then I'm going to give it a, um, an index. I'm gonna de demand that this be a uh, covariant tensor uh, vector. So, uh, so this prints out as T sub A. Uh, okay, so this, this tensor has a uh, a metric associated with it. So you can use, you can raise and lower its indices and you can do that just like you would in exact. So uh, I can say plus a here to raise this index. Uh, and usually I wouldn't even type this plus. So I just write T uh, a. And if you, but one of the principles here is that this, when I uh, use these, uh, this down value notation, uh, that's like I'm acting like this is um, a variable as if this were a function. Uh, this is not changing T1 at all. T1 is still a covariant, um, is still a covariant tensor. Um, if I want to look at the values of this though, you're gonna see that this uh, with the raised index, uh, this has been, uh, these values have been changed using the metric that is associated with it. Um, you can also look at individual uh, components of the metric. So for instance, this would be the X component. So that should be, this. since we have coordinates uh, T, X, um, Y, this is the second, uh, the second component. And so that's, that corresponds to the middle value here in this list. Um, okay. So as I had said before, like the tensors have a lot of stuff built uh, built in under the hood. You can you can look at what's going on by doing list at at on this uh, T one. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, but normally this isn't how you'd want to access this information. If you like forget what are the coordinates that I'm using, or you know what is my uh, what the what's the metric associated with this, you would normally you can call a bunch of functions to get that. And this is the way that I would recommend that you uh, that you do this. So for instance, um, <clears throat> if I want to know what the metric is that is associated with that, with that tensor, I would call metric on T1 and that spits out uh, that metric. I can ask whether something is a metric um, and that will say no. If I ask if the, if the metric G nu is a metric, metric that uses metric Q and that's like Boolean Q or integer Q or something that Mathematica would use. Uh, you can get the coordinates of the, um, that are associated with this tensor, I guess your T, X, Y, you can get the indices um, and that's minus A. Uh, you can also get the possible indices. So 
if you, you know, when we're doing uh, index gymnastics, you know, often we need lots of different indices and uh, the, the tensor doesn't really care whether I give this a B or an A or a C, but I have to give it a list. I have to give it something from this possible list. If I give this like a capital A, then it doesn't know what to do with that. So you have to give it something from the list of possible indices. Um, but so, so long as it's from that list, you can give it whatever you want. Uh, that doesn't change the values internally. Uh, you can get the rank of your tensor. You can get the space time dimensions. You can get the name, etc. cetera. So just paste these in. Okay, so uh, the reason that tensors have names is because as we'll see in a minute, uh, you can do some caching and that, uh, that helps out with, uh, with speed. So, okay, so that's sort of what's going on underneath the hood. And uh, the idea is that you do calculations like you, like you would with a lot of things in Mathematica, you do uh, some calculation, you assign a value to something on the left-hand side and then the thing on the right-hand side doesn't change. The, okay, so let's do, let's look at some standard um, GR calculations. So as uh, I showed earlier, I have this built-in metric that is the short shield metric. And if I wanted to say, if I wanted to compute the Christoffel symbols associated with this, then I can call a Christoffel symbol on my uh, metric and out comes a tensor that has three indices. And I can look at those values and they should be the, the ones that are in your standard textbook. You can call um, all the other things that you would expect to like Ricci tensor, Ricci scalar, and a lot of other built in uh, standard tensors on the metric. And so if I say Ricci tensor um, associated with short shield, that's, that gives me out uh, a tensor, which you might think if you have been doing your homework is going to give me zero. But in this case, uh, it doesn't. Now that's because, you know, there's a lot of math going on um, behind the scenes and Mathematica isn't necessarily always going to simplify everything as well as you'd like it to. Um, of course, if I, if I call simplify, that does, it does vanish. But um, what is, what may be useful and sometimes can speed things up and certainly can clean up internal calculations is to use an argument. Now, um, an option rather. So Ricci tensor here has a bunch of options associated with it. Um, in this case, just to uh, act with and act with um, nested. And that's because, you know, in order to compute the Ricci tensor, you have to compute the Riemann tensor and you have to compute the Christoffel symbols and you have to take derivatives. So um, in order, so um, what you might want to do is apply some sort of function at every step along the way. And so the function that I'm going to use is simplify. And what I'll do here is I'll call Ricci tensor um, on this metric. And uh, I will say act with simplify. And now if I, um, if I call tensor values on this, it should come out as zero. So this is, uh, is useful if you're, you know, you're storing things. Uh, you want, to, obviously, you'd like things to be as simple as possible. And you might want to, you can always, you can put whatever function you want here. You can group things, you can collect, et cetera. Okay, so when you're doing your tensor calculations, you're often gonna want to, you know, have multiple tensors that are gonna like multiply by each other. Or you're gonna wanna contract indices and all the normal things that we do. So, um, so let's say that we want to compute the Einstein tensor by hand. So if you will. So, um, so what I've got here is Ricci tensors uh, for short shield. And I'm also going to compute the Ricci scalar. And so that, that spits out two things here. These are both tensors. And note that just because this is, uh, doesn't have any indices, this, um, this Ricci scalar is still uh, a tensor. It has all of the, um, the machinery hidden inside it. 
uh, just looks like it's just a, a number or just like a symbol. Okay, so if I want to compute the Einstein tensor by hand, I'm just going to paste this in. So here, this is the expression that we have. Now, um, the reason that I want to go through this is that this does not is not um, actually a tensor yet. This is just an algebraic expression, uh, which is adding a tensor to a product of tensors, and there's a number involved. If if I call head on this expression then this, you know, the head is plus because this is a sum of two things. Now, in order to actually make this into one tensor, merge tensors. Now there's, uh, you, can, you can add tensors and you can do all sorts of things, but usually you just want to call merge tensors. Uh, and then what's going to come out is one actual tensor. And then behind the scenes, general relativity tensors is, is creating some um, expression here through the um, the input to try to show, okay, this is something, some generic stuff that has indices alpha beta. Um, and so now if I look at the values here, <clears throat> you're gonna find out that it's got a bunch of stuff that in theory should equal zero. Uh, merge tensors should have uh, an act with simplify that I can use also. So if I go, then that um, then what what comes out here it does equal zero so the, so the key thing is that, that things don't get merged until into one tensor until you make them um, okay so with that uh, I'm going to move on to the next section where we're going to talk about how to take derivatives so so if I have a my have my Schwarzschild metric here, and suppose I want to form the inverse metric, and raise some indices, and maybe I want to take a derivative of that. So your normal D function that you use in Mathematica to take derivatives has been overloaded. And so I can take a derivative uh, with respect to uh, alpha space-time index in the covariant form. Um, GS um, derivative, uh, so the divergence here. Uh, now note that by default, this isn't going to trace over indices. Again, you'd have to call merge tensors in order to do that. Um, and so I can, I can see what does this look like. Um, and so this is just gonna be some So I'm a whole bunch of numbers. Okay, uh, so partial derivatives are less interesting, although they're important. The uh, I think what's more what's more important here is to look at covariant derivatives, and so let's uh, see what happens if I want to take a covariant derivative of the metric. So let's look at another built-in metric here, G R N. Look at the riser Nordstrom metric. Um, so this is. Um, is this this metric? You can also write this as Rn. So there's like some simplifications. You don't have to type so much. Um, and so this is the is in your normal uh, your normal coordinates. And uh, if you want to take the the covariant derivative, there is a function built in called covariant d. And so. You can take the derivative of an expression or of a tensor with respect to as many indices as you want. Uh, and then you can also use it to take a derivative along the four velocity as we will see in a moment. So I'm gonna take the covariant derivative of this um, and then I'm gonna give it a downstairs index. So you have to be careful as usual. You know, you uh, If I want to take uh, the derivative, I have to obey uh, normal index rules. Uh, I can't have, for instance, you know, you can't have two my two alphas down um, downstairs. It's going to complain at you. So in this case, I know that G R N the indices are alpha and beta. So I'm going to take my derivative with gamma downstairs, and I get out this expression. 
So again, this is not uh, actually a tensor yet. You'd have to merge this. This is a, a sum and a product of a whole bunch of tensors. Um, but once you, um, so, but once you merge them together, you should find the covariant derivative of the metric should vanish. And so I'll call merge tensors on this and tensor values and simplify. And indeed everything goes away just like it should. All right, uh, so the next thing I wanna do is uh, talk about curves because you want to, you're gonna wanna probably do something involving uh, four velocities and world lines and all the things that we love. So, um, so there's some built-in curves uh, using uh, the curves that you might expect. So here is a four velocity, um, a short shield and this is um, is just is gen is generically parameterized in terms of your energy and your angular momentum. So, uh, so we have some um, some values built in. Now, I should warn you, and I think this like uh, is is relevant um, in general. You know, when you're using packages, but you know, you gotta you're sort of on your with great power comes great responsibility. You know, if you define something as R or as uh, as L or M, you know, it's gonna mess everything up. So, you know, you, you have to, this these um, symbols uh, that are built in here, you know, they're defined behind the scenes, um, but it's not magic. So you have to, you have to be careful. And so you, you have to, when you're using this, you know, you can't go around defining tau to be some number like four, it's gonna mess things up. Um, okay, so if I wanna take, so now I want to do is I want to um, I'm going to parallel transport the four velocity along itself. So I'm going to call covariant D, and what you should have is if you if you parallel transport U S the four velocity on short shield uh, along itself, then uh, then you get out this expression. Note that for curves, when we have a curve, you know you see here it shows you that things are parameterized by some uh, curve parameter, in this case, the proper time tau. If you, um, I'm gonna just copy in from the other notebook. Uh, this is what I've got here is I've merged tensors, I've simplified things, I've called tensor values on this. And I said to you a second ago that the um, <clears throat> parallel transporting, so you might expect this to equal zero but we've got to do a little bit of simplification for that to work. Um, and so in order to do that, we need a set of rules. So the uh, things to associate the tau derivative of T, the tau derivative of R, et cetera, with the expressions from the, the four velocity. And so once you apply a little mathematical magic, then this does come out to equal zero. All right, uh, I don't want to, uh, drone on too long. This Some of this stuff is a little bit fast here. Um, this is all in the documentation and you can of course look at this notebook later um, if you if you find this confusing. Some of this is just you know things like thread and through and all this stuff. This is just um, uh, Mathematica stuff the whereas uh, things involving you know tensor values and coordinates those are built into general relativity tensors but I've tried to make things so that, so that they work with the built-in Mathematica um, functionality naturally. The, okay, so I wanna, only wanna talk for another five or 10 minutes here, make sure there's times for questions if people have them. Uh, so I want to, I wanna talk briefly about caching because, you know, depending on what calculations you're doing, of course, you don't wanna always be recomputing the same thing. Now, uh, so general relativity tensors does support caching, but you know, as always when you're caching things, you gotta be careful make sure that you're doing things smart. By, so by default, it starts with cached, caching turned off. Um, so that's, uh, so it starts off as false. Um, if uh, you want to, suppose I want to compute the Einstein tensor associated with the Kerr, um, with the Kerr-Newman metric. So to metric Kerr-Newman is built in Call that KN as a shortcut. Um, we've got a bunch of normal tensor values here. And I'm going to compute the Einstein tensor associated with that. And 
see how long that takes. And so that took about two and a half seconds. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff going on in, in between, but you know, maybe I want to use uh, the value that comes out of that a bunch of times. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take um, this global variable tensor, uh, cache tensor values, and I'm gonna set that equal to true. And then uh, when I call this again, the first time it should be about the same time. Mathematica will do a little bit of internal caching. Um, but the second time that I call this, you know, it's gonna be really fast. So this has, has stored uh, all the, not only the values, uh, the value of the Einstein tensors, but it stored the intermediate values as well. So in order to compute the Einstein tensor, we needed the Ricci scalar, the Ricci tensor, the Ricci, the Christoffel symbols, et cetera. So this is, um, is something that, that should speed things up a bit. Now, but as I said, like with caching, you gotta be careful because you like to uh, store things as efficiently as possible. And if I, um, if, if I just call this like this without any sort of simplification going on behind the scenes, then you know, things could be, can wind up being pretty, pretty messy. If I call tensor values here, I don't know, but my guess is this is gonna be pretty, pretty large. Yeah, so this is some, some very large expression. Um, but if we, we, and this has now been cached, we'd like to cache something that is more efficient. Uh, so let's look at, we're gonna look at a slightly different example here, but let's look at, um, at the Einstein tensor for uh, the short shield metric. So let's call this, except I'm gonna replace this with short shield. And this, the uh, the Einstein tensor, but now I what I want to do is I'm going to um, use a different option here, which is act with nested. And so now this this option is going to get passed all the way down. So when when the Ricci tensor is called, it'll get passed to that. When the Riemann tensor is called, it'll pass to that. All the way down to the Christoffel symbols, etc. And so now it's going to apply simplify it every step along the way. Um, and so when I call, when I call, um, Ricci, so let's, let's just see what happens if I call, uh, Ricci tensor on this, uh, and I say tensor values, if I haven't tested this, so we'll see how this goes. Oh, good. So, um, then this comes out of zeros, which if I hadn't, um, and that comes out of zeros immediately there, there, there was, that was just pulled up from cash. Um, you can. You can turn off caching by setting um, the global variable to false, uh, but of course, then you you might want to clear uh, all your cached values. And so there's a there's a um, there's a function that uh, that does this and allows you to remove your um, your cache values. Um, okay, so I've got 15 minutes left. Uh, I had uh, some examples that I was thinking of working through. Um, and I think I'll show one of them briefly, uh, scalar wave equation on short shield and including um, using some covariant derivatives. Uh, I think I can do that in five minutes. And then if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them unless people want me to uh, stop now. Hearing no objections, I will carry forth. So, Scalar wave equation on short shield. So let's, uh, I'm gonna jump to the second example from the notebook here. Um, so I have to, first thing I'm gonna need to do uh, is define, I want to, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm interested in defining a scalar that has a form that is uh, a T, TR times a, a uh, spherical harmonic. So here, let me just paste this here. So this is my expression that I am planning on using. So again, this looks like this is just a symbol phi, but there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood. And the reason why that's important is when I call covariant derivative, it needs to know what metric it's associated with. Um, so if I, so if we look at uh, phi here, you can see, oh, uh, here you can see that there's a bunch of things 
uh, under the hood there. Now, when I call um, covariant D on this, I can say, and actually I'm gonna turn off caching here. Did I do that? No. Uh, cache tensor values equals false. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna call covariant D. So this is the is so this will be the um, the box operator acting on phi. And so in order to do that, I'll use alpha comma minus alpha here. And wave scalar one. And so a whole bunch of <clears throat> um of here. Um, why is that different? That's more efficient if I go that way. Okay. Uh, and then I, uh, and then I can, can merge this, this stuff together to make a, um, to make a single tensor. So, and so this is in the, uh, is in the notebook that I shared. The, the key thing here, the reason why I wanted to show this is it shows that you can like pass a more complicated function to your act with um, option. And so what comes out is something that has already been collected on the terms that you want. And so when I call tensor values on this, you see this has already been collected on the YLMs and then the TR terms are separately collected upon. Uh, you can go further and you can um, collect upon, you, you can, you know, change your YLMs into um, Ls and Ms, et cetera, using the eigenvalue equation. Um, and that's all in the notebook. Okay, uh, so with that, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, oh, I did wanna show one more thing. Okay, this was the, the last thing I wanted to show. There's another example that I had here. This, um, so this is the same uh, thing that I just called, except I'm adding some new options here. Um, and I'm gonna actually get rid of that. Uh, and what this does behind is that every is that because I'm calling multiple covariant derivatives, uh, it is convenient to use this merge nested option, which allows you, you don't come out with, uh, an expression like I have above here, which is a product of uh, of tensors and sums of tensors. Instead, this goes ahead and merges it all into one thing just to start with. Uh, so that's another thing you can do. Okay, obviously there's a lot more built in uh, and there's a lot in the documentation, but I think I'm gonna leave it there. And if people have questions, I'd be happy to take them. So thank you very much. I think the first question has been answered uh, about uh, doing kind of, uh, the reads that Manager tensor also works for tensor products. Can you show the notation? Um, does merge tensor also work for tensor products? Can I show the notation? Uh, yeah. So, um, so when I have, um, so so merge tensor basically is going to do like whatever you want it to do. But if I have, for instance, um, Covariant D on um, GS. I think this gives you an example of this, right? So, so here uh, you see a product of two tensors here, like say the first term, and then all you have to do is call is call merge tensors on this, and that turns it all into one tensor. Because um, what this thing, you know, what comes out of the of the covariant derivative is is an object with three indices. Um, once you've added it all together, but, um, but you have to, but by default, the behavior of general relativity tensors is that this is they are not merged. So the next question is, uh, uh, okay. Does this package compare uh, to Mapu? I use a differential geometry package. Mapu. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, uh, I mean, I know that there is, uh, there are things like this in, in Maple, um, there, I mean, and there's obviously other, there's, there's several different tensor packages in Mathematica too. 
Um, so I don't know exactly what the, uh, how, like what's available in, um, um, you know, GR tensor or something. But this, this is not on Maple. Okay, the next one is, can you perform a time space splitting of some indices in a symbolic expression? So when you are contracting two vectors, can you write it as a time contraction and a spatial contraction? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, can, can I do like three plus one splitting? Yeah. Uh, exactly. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so I don't have that built in yet. I mean, if there, there are things um, that people are interested in, I think the way that I wrote this is probably in some extent, to some extent limited in what would be a natural, um, you know, natural to do. Uh, and uh, I, I would really like to have, for instance, sub manifolds built in. And that's one of the things that, I, that I've, I've worked on a little bit. So that, for instance, you could have like the M2, S2 decomposition um, or a three plus one splitting things. Um, and I, it's something that I intend to work on. Um, but I would also uh, say that, you know, this is not probably, this is never going to be as powerful as X act. And there may be things that you try to do and you're like, this, this can't do it. And uh, you might have to invest some more time in, in learning a more powerful tool. Okay, so the next question is, uh, does caching will also store other tensors associated with a uh, specific uh, that's what calculated here. So I think, I think it was also there. Yeah. I, I think the question is whether, for instance, the Ricci scalar, which you have to compute to compute the Einstein tensor, is also caged. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Everything, all of the sub, all of the things along the way get cached. Um, so uh, you can you can see the things that are um, uh, are cached by calling cache tensor values. And it'll print out in this case a whole slew of things. Here you can see there was some we we computed something with the Kerr Newman metric and the Christoffel symbols and the Schwarzschild metric, etc. All these things got cached. Yeah. So there is another question. Can one linearize the Einstein equation with this? So uh, I don't have. Oh, let me think. Now I'm trying to remember. I feel like I did something with this, but uh, it doesn't, this doesn't support like natively um, perturbation um, expansions. Uh, I do, one of the examples that's built in shows, you know, how to um, compute the Lorenz gauge um, Schwarzschild Einstein equations uh, at first order, but it doesn't, um, but I, you can't just take the um, the Einstein equations and throw in a generic metric and have it spit out, you know, first order, second order equations, etc. cetera. Uh, that's, I think is beyond what we can do here. There's another question is a basic one. Uh, asked if the four velocity uh, can be solved for arbitrary theta. Oh, yeah. So the um, so in this case, of course, we're on short shield, so um, it doesn't really limit you to set the uh, the four velocity to be in the plane, at least not for a um, for a geodesic. Um, but this is what did I? Let me scroll up to here. Where did we do this? Four velocity vector short shield generic. Um, let's see what, what let's see what I have for Kerr generic. If we look at the tensor values here, um, this has this has generic theta. And um, you could certainly, it would not be hard to create a four velocity vector for short shield that was of this form that doesn't have, um, that does not have theta restricted.
a couple of questions. Uh, it says uh, if we can do coordinate transformation easily. Um, I would say no, not easily, because you're uh you're starting with a with a metric this this is sort of assuming you're starting with a metric that is that has um a set of coordinates um that is interesting though and is something that i think could be built in if people were um were interested in that that's a i think would be could potentially be very useful but it doesn't have that now so the answer not easily more more difficultly Thank you. I don't see any other question that has not been answered online or uh, in the chat. So, so wait. There was there was one other question just earlier on about tetra calculations. Maybe oh, was there? that was missed. Can you do tetra calculations? Yeah, there is stuff about tetrads in here. Um, just uh, very briefly so for instance i recognize we're out of, basically out of time um so on curve so i i mean so i built this in because i was needing to do some some curve calculations uh so the kinnersley nulls tetrad is built in and this is not um this needs to be fleshed out more there's there's still stuff there but this but the notebook that i sent shows how to um derive the Tchaikovsky equation, for instance, ass assuming the uh, Kinnersley null tetrad. And, you, and it includes things like the, uh, the Kinnersley derivatives that are associated with the tetrad. Um, but um, as far as like generic tetrad calculations are not built in. Um, but again, uh, if, you know, depending on what people are interested in, I'd be happy to, to work on adding more things. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you again for the talk. Yep, I just want, okay. So, is there any other question? I don't see one. So, uh, I will ask Martin to start his. Uh, presentation and thank you again, Seth. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, how's my font size? Do I need to increase the zoom a bit for people? I think they are fine, but we have huge TV in front of us, so maybe you can maybe see a little bit. That's probably better, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, let's get started then. So I'll be talking about geodesics in Kerr. I'll be talking a bit, a bit about the general theory behind them and sort of lots of the terminology that's involved. And also how many of these things and, uh, are currently included in the current geodesics package. The current geodesics package itself is, uh, as many contributors, so I've contributed to this, Nils has done a lot. Uh, I think the Chapel Hill group has contributed quite a bit. Barry probably has his hand in pieces of this, I assume. Um, so this is not something that I purely uh, created. In fact, most of it is not stuff that I created. Uh, anyway, so geodesics in Curse Baseline, let's start art with the Kerr metric. Uh, can people see my cursor, by the way? Uh, yes, we can. Excellent. Then I can actually point to things. That's good. Um, yeah, so the current metric we all know, hopefully. Uh, one thing to note is we're using uh, units where G is N, S, C is 1. Uh, other thing to note is that my polar coordinate, instead of using uh, theta, I use Z, which is cosine theta. This is useful when you're doing computer algebra with uh, things because it avoids uh, mathematically having to think about uh, trig identities every step of the way. 
uh, the worst thing it will encounter here is a square root of one minus z squared uh, once in a while. And it can usually figure that one out. Um, so the current metric, um, and we'll want to solve geodesics in the current metric. And specifically, we'll want to solve bound geodesics in the current metric. So we'll have some trajectory, which we'll label x, uh, and its form velocity will be labeled u. And the thing we want to solve is the geodesic equation in Kerr, which you all know my form. Uh, this is the last time we're actually going to see the actual Kerr geodesic equation because we're just going to ignore the, uh, the Kerr geodesic equation and not solve it, uh, and solve it by not solving it. So what, what do I mean by that is, as any intro and GR course will have taught you, it's much easier to find your geodesics by looking at constants of motion rather than trying to solve the second order differential equation. Um, so what constants of motion do exist in Kerr? So the first is obvious. Uh, the normalization of the four velocity is a constant of motion along any geodesic um, by, uh, well, because that's the way it works. Um, that's how we defined uh, a geodesic. Um, second, in Kerr, we have two killing vector fields. Uh, and we can easily spot these just from looking at the metric. The metric doesn't depend explicitly on either t or phi. So the t and phi derivatives actually uh, are both killing tensor fields. So we have two killing, tensor, uh, killing vector fields, uh, which we can use to construct uh, two constants of motion, which are known as uh, the specific uh, energy and the specific angular momentum or specific actual uh, angular momentum uh, of your geodesic. Um, so the, what Carter showed somewhere in the early 70s, I think, or maybe even the late 60s, is that the Kerr metric actually has also has a killing tensor, which produces a fourth uh, constant of motion um, called the Carter constant now. So if you take this uh, combination where here L and N are the uh, principal null vectors of Kerr space time, if you want to be specific, uh, then if you contract that tensor twice with your four velocity, you will get a constant motion along any geodesic. Uh, and we'll be using the convention where the Carter constant is this Q, which is shifted by some other constant of motion because that is convenient. Um, so if you take these equations one, two, three, and four, and just if you would just write them in Mathematica and tell Mathematica to solve them for the derivatives, uh, Mathematica would spit something out which looks pretty much like this after uh, some mild simplification. So we now have four first order equations rather than sort of second order uh, differential equations to solve. Moreover, uh, we see that the right hand side here for the R equation contains only r and not z. And the right-hand side for the z equation contains uh, z, but not r. Now I've cheated a little bit because I've moved the factor of sigma to the left-hand side here. And sigma, as you may have seen, depends on both r and z. So we're not quite decoupled yet. Uh, and similarly, if you look at the t and phi equation of motion, those are simply things which are sum of r and z, once you've gotten rid of the, the z factor, uh, the sigma factor here. So, and I suggestedly written it this way because you see there's exactly one sigma factor for each derivative of tau appearing. So what we can do is introduce what is known as mino time here denoted by lambda, which is simply defined as that, um, small step in lambda is a small step in uh, tau divided by sigma. So if we now change to this mean time 
uh, parameter rather than uh, the proper time tau, uh, the sigmas disappear and we end up with a set of equations that is completely uh, decoupled. So the right hand side here is just a fourth order, po order polynomial in R. The right hand side here is just a fourth order polynomial in Z, which we'll call R, capital R and capital Z. And here, again, it is just the sum of a function of R and a function of Z. And these are all just rational functions of R and Z. Um, and we can have sort of a, a closer look at what do these equations look like. So this right hand side here is a fourth order polynomial. So we can write it as a, uh, factorize it in terms of roots. Uh, and because we see that that factor is there, we need to put that in front. Um, and for bound orbits incurred, these roots will always satisfy uh, partially conventions, but also partially a, a, a hierarchy of uh, inequalities. R1 is always the biggest root, R2 is the second root, and then R3 is the third root, but is outside of the horizon. And then the fourth root is always inside both horizons of your current uh, metric, but always larger than zero. Um, and for bound orbits, the specific energy is smaller than one. That's what it means to be bound. So this factor is negative. So that means that this right hand side here is negative if you go to extremely large R. What this means is that you can solve the equation when it's negative. So the region at extremely large R here is forbidden. Then the region between R1 and R2, it will be positive because it has to change sign there. The region between R3, R2 and R3 is forbidden and there's a second allowed region for the equation of motion between R3 and R4. Uh, we are only interested in what's happening between R1, which will be the periapsis, uh, the apapsis or apocenter uh, of our orbit and R2, which will be the periapsis or pericenter uh, of the orbit. Uh, if you want to have fun, you can look at what orbits look like between these two turning points. In principle, you'll find solutions that are oscillating between them, but you also find that these are always solutions that are going into the black hole, out of the black hole, into the black hole. Now, so these, if you look at the extended, uh, new, uh, extended Penrose diagram for Kerr, these are going through all the regions. Um, Similarly, uh, if we look at the equation for the, the power equation for Z, there will be term, there will be, first of all, it is a fourth order polynomial in Z. But we'll actually see it's only Z squared and Z to the fourth. So it's actually a second order polynomial in Z squared. <clears throat> and it has turning points. Uh, so it has two distinct turning points plus minus uh, so the smallest one we'll call Z1, the bigger one Z2. Uh, Z1 is always between zero and one, which is a good thing because it is the cosine of theta uh, that uh, would go there. And Z2 is always much bigger than uh, one. So we don't end up having polar solutions, at least not for bound orbits uh, to play around with. Um, These turning points can actually be used to identify what we mean by an orbit. So any orbits, bound orbit in curve will be identified by R1, R2, and Z1. Um, for the purpose of the Kerr geodesics package, we prefer to uh, parameterize the orbit by the semi that is rectum P and eccentricity E and inclination parameter. X, which are related to these roots as follows. So the 
uh, epo center is the same that is reckon, uh, divided by one minus the eccentricity, etc. While Z1 um, is related to this X parameter as the square root of one minus X. Uh, or in particularly inversely, X is square root of one minus Z1 times the sine of the angular momentum. So what this means is that we have eccentricities between zero and one for certain uh, for bound orbits, and that x runs between one and minus one, where one is a prograde equatorial orbit, minus one is a retrograde uh, equatorial orbit, and x is zero means that you have an orbit going through the pole of yours. Furthermore, p has to be bigger than a certain value, which we'll get back to later. So how are these functions implemented in uh, the package? So first you need to load the curve geodesics package. Uh, normally I'd like to load the packages using the needs command because that's usually more robust, but somehow that's broken. So that's a question for the other developers. This wasn't broken last week. So something Barry did over the weekend broke this, I think. Um, anyway, we can load it using get uh, and that will work. Um, and for example, we'll have, uh, we can now solve, uh, given these parameters identifying orbit, we can find the corresponding constant of motion, for example, the energy. And all these things are known analytically and they are coded up uh, in the package. So if I evaluate this thing, it will spit out a, a large uh, but exact expression. Um, and you could probably simplify it and might uh, simplify it. Um, however, for most purposes, you would, would want to evaluate things numerically. So for example, we can numerically evaluate uh, the constant motion and in fact, there's a separate uh, command that will evaluate all constants of motion for us given a, a so a spin P, E and X or an apex uh, of your orbit. So it will give you the energy, angular momentum and Carter constant of this particular orbit. Um, as with the uh, spheroidal, uh, spin weight spheroidal packages, these functions will follow, uh, will track uh, the input precision uh, for the output precision. So if I take inputs that have 100 inches of precision, it will give us outputs with 100 inches of precision. Similarly, we can calculate the frequencies of the orbit. So there will be, with each of these equations, I'll scroll back here, there will be a frequency associated. So there will be a fre uh, frequency associated with the radial motion, there will be frequency associated with the polar motion, with the Z motion. There will be a average growth of T and an average growth of phi. Uh, we normally don't output that one, but we do uh, care about these three. So these are the radial frequency, the polar frequency, and what's called the azimuthal frequency. Uh, and again, the calculating them involves solving the average of these equations, which end up being some uh, elliptic integrals, which you can solve by standard methods for elliptical integrals, uh, and by some heroics, uh, by, that were done by people in the past, which we implemented here. Um, so you can calculate the, uh, I should. So and you can calculate your frequencies with respect to different times. So the native calculation would be with respect to mean time. So that would be the equations I just showed. Uh, but you can also calculate the average growth of your proper time and then the ratio with the other frequencies will give you the proper time frequencies, or you can get the border link with time frequencies uh, equally well. Um, again, because these are simple elliptic type integral equations, you can actually just solve the entire orbit analytically. So if you look at the solutions for R and Z, they are essentially a ratio of some uh, Jacobi signs 
uh, with some rational functions involving all the turning points. Um, and the Z is again, just, it will be a Jacobi sine uh, function. Relatively simple uh, to do. Uh, if you look at the solutions for T and phi, those are a bit less slightly to look at, hence not being here, but they are also known analytically. Uh, the thing to note here, QR and QZ are the phases of the radial and the polar motion. Uh, and they are defined in such a way that they grow linearly uh, with mean of time. So these are essentially the, the angles that are conjugate to the uh, appropriate actions, uh, if you know about action angle variables. Uh, and in these expressions, I've chosen these such that QR0 corresponds to R being at the uh, Perry center and Q's uh, the polar angle being zero means that we're at the node. So going through the equator and going up for the equator. Um, somehow there's a one here. Um, these are all implemented and we can uh, evaluate these. So one of the functions in the current GS package is this current geo orbit, uh, which we can evaluate with the option analytic. Uh, and this seemingly takes a long time. That is a bit misleading. Uh, it evaluates almost instantly, but uh, a cool feature just added that isn't quite working properly is that it provides a nice preview of the orbits uh, in the output object and evaluating that plot takes a couple of seconds at this time. We need to find a way to cache that. Again, something for the developer discussion later, maybe. Uh, anyway, so evaluating Kerr geo orbit outputs a Kerr geo orbit function uh, object, which encodes all the relevant information about the orbit. So for one, if you evaluate at some parameter value lambda, uh, it will give you the solutions uh, to the T, R, theta, and phi uh, solutions of orbit. So despite me using Z here as a coordinate, I think the uh, package itself is actually using theta. Um, we should be able to see because there should be a arc cosine in the fourth argument. Yes, so that's actually fair. Um, or you can evaluate it at a numerical uh, point and it will just give you four numbers. Uh, but the square geo orbit function also encodes all the other information. So you can get the constant of motion, uh, you can get frequencies. And if you want to see what sort of information is all in there, you can uh, find all the possible keys that you could put here like this. Um, this uses the method analytic, which uses the analytic solutions for orbits, uh, which aren't always the fastest to evaluate. So there's also an implementation using spectral integration of the, uh, of the same equations that was supplied by the Chapel Hill group, um, which uh, we can also evaluate. And you see that that is about a factor of four to five faster to evaluate than uh, one of the, uh, the analytic orbits. On the other hand, the analytic orbits could be useful if you want to take uh, derivatives with respect to uh, orbital parameters, for example. Uh, and these things are the same to uh, pretty much uh, numerical precision. Or we could, well, I guess we couldn't because I haven't evaluated them at high precision. But we could evaluate them at any precision that we want. Um, and we can uh, could make a plot of these. So for example, here I implement a plot of the orbit uh, where the orbit uh, goes through exactly one radial period. Uh, and increase the number of periods. And as you take more and more periods, 
it will systematically fill. Oh, now I've taken too, uh, uh, too long and we don't have enough points to resolve this. So we need more plot points. Let's do that. No, it takes a while. Um, and as we take more periods, it will eventually completely fill a torus shaped region around the black hole. And this was probably overdoing it a bit. Um, there we go. Um, so it has filled a torus like region around uh, the black hole with the orbit. Um, so there are certain orbits that are special around Kerr. So the first obvious case is if you look at circular orbits, we all love circular orbits because they're simple. So circular orbits are characterized by the eccentricity is zero, which means that the first two radial roots or turning points are equal. And some special cases of circular orbits include uh, the innermost bound spherical orbits. So that is a circular orbit which has specific energy equal to one. Uh, and again, one of the things that implement, is implemented in the current geodesics package is values for where these are. So this gives current geo ipso gives the radius of uh, the innermost bound spherical orbits for spin A and uh, inclination X. Uh, so if when the inclination is zero, we actually have an analytical expression for them. Uh, more generically, you it will just evaluate to some value. Similarly, there is the uh, photon sphere. So this photon sphere is characterized by the fact that the circular orbit is zero with energy and angular momentum that are infinite because you've put a massive object on a uh, light-like orbit that doesn't go, that gives you infinite energy. That's the way to find it, one of the ways to find it. Uh, again, we have analytical expressions for these uh, for Schwarzschild um, or for equatorial orbits in Kerr. Um, and for generic orbits in Kerr, it should be able to just plot where these are in a reasonable amount of time. Um, another type of spatial orbit are what are known uh, are marginally bound or parabolic orbits. So these are orbits with energy equal to one, which corresponds to the eccentricity being one, um, or that the radial turning point, first radial turning point goes to infinity. Um, currently, most of the functions are actually broken for these. So this might be a fun little project for people that want to uh, contribute uh, later during the workshop session and implement the appropriate limits of these because the energy of these orbits are well defined. So in the principle it should be given by the limit value of the generic uh, expressions that are already in the code. But when you evaluate them, it leads to uh, uh, divisions of zero by zero or infinite by infinite and something being indeterminate. Uh, another special case that is often important are equatorial orbits. So these mean that your radial turning point, your polar turning point is zero, which corresponds to or Carter also being zero uh, and correspond with or inclination parameter being either plus one for a prograde orbit or minus one for a retrograde equatorial orbit. Um, another special case that we already saw above are polar orbits, so x equal to zero. This corresponds to the radial, the polar turning point being one, uh, and the angular momentum being zero. Um, so for polar orbits, the console motion work, but currently the frequencies seem broken. Again, something uh, that 
could be fun as a mini project to fix later on. Finally, one of the features of black holes is that there is the smallest possible orbit that is stable. Uh, and this is characterized by the, the inner, so the, the pericenter, so the second radial turning point is equal to the third radial turning point in our radial equation. Um, so the most well-known case is that of a circular equatorial orbit. In that case, the radii are known analytically. It can be plotted like this. Um, one thing that here I saw, well, while preparing this, I saw all sort of things that are slightly broken is that in principle, when going to negative spin values, these should be, so the blue line and the yellow line should be this, that part should be blue here and that part should be yellow. Um, easy enough to fix. Um, <clears throat> similarly, you can look at circular orbits that are not equatorial. In that case, we don't have uh, complete uh, analytic solutions, but we can still plot them quite easily. Uh, and in fact, there is code in uh, the toolkit that allows you to calculate the location of the last stable orbit or separatrix uh, for any spin eccentricity and inclination. And it will just spit out where the appropriate uh, semi-lattice rectum value is uh, that is the smallest one. Um, so yeah, doing good in time. So the final thing that was recently added to the package is a sub package for parallel transport. So the parallel transport equation along geodesic incur is just that the covariant derivative of some vector or covector uh, in the direction of the geodesic has to be zero. Um, and basically what we'll want to do is find an entire tetrad of vectors that is parallel transported along uh, a geodesic, because in that case, once you express a vector in the tetrad, the components with respect to the uh, tetrad will no longer change. So one leg to find is simply, we know that the four velocity itself is parallel transported along the geodesic, so we can use that. Another thing that I'm not gonna go into, but I'm just gonna state here is that Kerr has a killing Yano tensor, which is essentially the square root of the killing tensor. Um, and it had one of the properties that it has, if you contract it with the four velocity, is that it produces a vector that is parallelly transported along your geodesic. So we have two legs. So once you fix two legs of a tetrad, the only remaining freedom of the tetrad is a rotation of the plane perpendicular to those two vectors. So that corresponds to a single uh, angle. And one can show that the angle satisfies a relatively simple equation of motion with respect to mean time. Again, these are elliptic type integrals to solve, uh, which can be solved analytically, which has been done and has been implemented in the Kerr geodesics parallel transport sub package, which you have to look separately, uh, which introduces the care parallel transport frame uh, function, which is, a lot like the current geo orbit function, it produces a current uh, parallel transport frame function, uh, which has among the many things that are encoded inside this function is actually the trajectory, the same we had before. Uh, and here I just took the code that Niels had for producing that nice picture we saw during the coffee break. So we'll get there in a sec. Uh, it has the console of motion. It also has the precession frequency of this. Uh, uh, angle of your tetrad. Uh, and if you want the frame itself, you can either evaluate it at a parameter and it will give you the exact solution in terms of elliptic functions and elliptic amplitudes, etc. Or you can evaluate it numerically at 42 and it will give you a bunch of co-vectors uh, which each of uh, at each point along your uh, geodesic. Again, if you want to know what things that are actually strong in this function, you can find all the keys like this. Um, so now let's reproduce the 
plot that Niels had that was uh, there during the coffee break. Um, and I can't load this with needs anymore. But it will look like that. So we're going to use a SES package to manipulate this output frame. Um, uh, so we'll get the current metric, we'll get uh, the frame that's parallel transported and raise a lower. It's in, we'll have it with a lower index at first. Uh, then we can transform things to Cartesian coordinates and to things with an upper index and then create some stuff. And as I'm talking, it will generate these hopefully. Um, and produce this plot. Are we hanging? Uh, oh, there we go. And there we go. Plot created. Um, so you can, so for the record, this notebook is available for uh, the website. I think I saw somebody post a link earlier. Um, so if you want to play around with this, uh, and that brings us to the end of what I uh, want to talk about. I have a couple of exercises prepared. Maybe this would be a good time to first ask qu some questions and then I'll go over some of the exercises that people can look at uh, for either the remainder of the time or uh, later at home in some work. So are there any questions? In the chat, there are no questions. So, uh, exercises. Yeah, let's do the exercises. Uh, yeah, so I prepared a couple of exercises for people to look at. Um, so the first exercise um, revolves about, around evolving a in spiral. So typically, if you want to uh, evolve an inspire, we'll use the Tchaikovsky code that will output flux, the average changes of the energy and angular momentum and Carter constants uh, as a function of our AP, E, and X. So if we actually want to use that to evolve the inspire, we either need to convert this to those to E, L, and X, or do, uh, those to P, E, and X. Uh, so Question here, here is see if you can use the functions in the toolkit to create uh, uh, these evolution equations. So, that, and I've prepared three levels of difficulty here. The first one is simpler, simplest one. For circular orbits and Schwarzschild, uh, write a function that takes as an input your uh, energy flux at a radius r and outputs your radius r and your r dot. The medium version of this is the same question, but now do it for eccentric orbits in Schwarzschild. So now you will have to transform E dot and L dot uh, to get P dot and E dot. The hard one is the generic one where you take all three E dot, L dot, and Q dots and find the whole factor. In fact, this one isn't actually much more difficult than that. Um, second exercise is about orbital re resonances. So a resonant orbit is an orbit where the ratio of two of the orbital frequencies is some rational number. Uh, for example, the ratio of the radial frequency to the azimuthal frequency being one to two. Uh, besides being Pretty, these orbits are of special interest for various reasons. Uh, the exercise will involve finding these. The easy one will be find a, in Schwarzschild, find a orbit with radial to phi ratio of two to three and plot the orbit. The medium version will be find, incur, find a triple resonance. So find an orbit with ratio, a radial to polar to as a movable ratio of one to two to three. And finally, as a hard problem, 
since the precession introduces a fourth frequency, see if you can find a quadruple resonance in Kerr with ratios two to three to four to six. And yes, it does exist. And please plot yours. Beyond these exercises, I have some suggestions for projects reaching from things that can be done on maybe the third day for people who want to get into figuring out how things work. So the first project I also already alluded to, which is find edge cases for say extreme spin, polar orbits, marginal bound orbits for which some of the current geo functions are broken and shouldn't be broken and implement exceptions for these cases. Um, the later projects are more uh, something like either a bachelor or master's thesis or beyond. So one thing of interest is actually implementing all of this, which we have currently have for bound orbits, but for scattering orbits or for orbits that are plunging into the black hole or for no light-like orbits. All of these are useful. So the last one, I think was a paper by Sambrella relatively recently that gives the analytic solutions for these, I think. Uh, and many of these others may actually exist in the literature, but it would be good to have them in the package uh, so that we're no longer just limited to just bound orbits. That's it. Any questions? Thank you, Martin. Uh, I don't see any questions, actually. Everything seems to be crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah. That, that or I massively confuse people to the degree that they no longer know what to ask. So I think we will break for another coffee break. So and thanks. see you in a half hour. Thanks, Martin. A great talk. OK. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to our last part of these sessions. Uh, and uh, is Scott Field ready for his presentation? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, we hear you clearly. Oh, great. Okay, let me turn on my video. I'll start. Thanks. Screen I'll sharing. As well. So I don't know if you heard. Uh, we have. Uh, 45 minutes for your presentation, but the last five are reserved for the questions. Usually they are online, the chat. Okay, but great. So do go for you to have the chat somewhere open when they are popping up the questions to answer them. If not, we probably leave them at the end for the five minute session. Well, okay. The last five minute part. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, please. Oh, sure. Thanks. Okay, let me just move something out of the way here. Okay, so um, thank you for the uh, invitation to speak today uh, on this uh, relatively new package. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Emory surrogate, which is a, um, it's a pure Python package that allows for the valuation of um, in spiral merger and ring down. Uh, gravitational wave surrogate models. Um, so this implementation was part of a uh, recent publication describing the model. So today's presentation, I'm going to kind of break this down into two parts. So the first part, um, which hopefully will be no more than 20 minutes, uh, will be sort of a brief introduction to Emory surrogate models, um, describing their construction and, and some of the uh, key things that will show up also in the tutorial. So this should hopefully help understanding of the code and some of the data that's required to run the code. 
Uh, and then the last part, maybe 20 to 25 minutes, uh, will be sort of under walking you through how to evaluate the model, um, understand the data files, and so on. Um, okay, so the first thing to note, uh, if you're uh, looking for some extra homework to do during the uh, this first part of the uh, uh, talk, um, there are certain tutorial dependencies that we're going to need um, in about 20 minutes or so. Um, so if you don't have any of these installed, you could take a screenshot of this page um, to kind of see what your uh, to-do list might, might look like. Uh, many of these are pretty standard, but at least on my installation of Anaconda, I didn't ship with SciPy, uh, H5Py. Um, and then depending on how you've installed Python, you may or may not have uh, Jupyter, which is uh, a way to interact with Jupyter Notebook. So we'll need all of these. Uh, many of those are pretty quick to install, but this other piece here um, where it says wget, you can download this using wget if you're um, doing this from the, from the uh, command line, or you can just go to this website and download it by clicking on a button. Uh, this file is maybe on the order of 200 uh, uh, megabytes or so, uh, so it's not that big, but um, it's probably worthwhile to start downloading depending on your internet connection. Uh, so we'll come back to this in about uh, 20 minutes. Um, so the model that I'll be describing today um, is a surrogate model, and it it's uses tools that have been sort of developed over the past uh, 10 years or so at this point. Uh, so I just want to point out that this, this, this project, which the direct collaborators are in red, and, and Nur, uh, who is the lead author uh, on the paper, uh, he kind of led here, uh, but it required sort of input from various people through, through the years. Uh, so I just wanted to call attention to that. Uh, and then when we come to talk about the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit's implementation of the model, uh, Tusif Islam was very uh, helpful in importing some of these codes and this data to, the, to, uh, to that code base. Uh, so a quick overview of what surrogate models are. Uh, you may not have heard of them uh, before. They're um, sort of a, a strategy for overcoming some common computational bottlenecks when you need to work with in spiral merger and ring down waveforms. Uh, so typically it's the one of speed. So if you're doing something like template-based detection, so if you're searching for gravitational waves or doing parameter estimation, uh, you typically need to call the waveform generator multiple times. Uh, typical parameter estimation runs. So for example, the recent one that LIGO did for um, this unequal mass binary system, um, at least I've been told typical PE codes had to evaluate the model about 40 million times. So even if the model takes a second to run, this is basically not gonna, uh, not gonna work. So the models have to be extremely fast to run traditional Bayesian inference uh, parameter estimation codes. Um, and the, the method that we've sort of pursued to, to overcoming this um, is to take an underlying waveform uh, model, which is typically described by ordinary or partial differential equations and generate lots of data. Um, so this is sort of an offline stage, you're collecting training data and you use this training data to build a model that's fast to evaluate. Uh, so really the only thing that we're looking to do is, is recover what the original underlying differential equations would have predicted the gravitational wave to look like, but doing it much faster. Uh, so this is very similar to um, the very broad term of machine learning, um, means a whole lot of things to different people, but in, in, in some sense it's learning from data and that's, that's essentially what our uh, surrogate modeling techniques are, are, are after. Uh, that's uh, not by, by, by no means the only way to speed up uh, model evaluation. So uh, in some sense, the construction of closed form and phenomenological models and effective one body models are, are certainly one way to circumvent the need to run numerical relativity codes, uh, which are extremely slow. And then you can also take different approaches such as algorithmic or hardware optimizations uh, or parameter or kind of problem specific acceleration. So if you're doing parameter estimation, maybe there are different ways of approximating the log likelihood surface that can hopefully speed up the evaluation time. Um, so there are many different strategies. Uh, surrogate models are just sort of one. Uh, this is kind of an overview of the, 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 the landscape here. So uh, as I mentioned, these models have been built in various contexts for, for many years. Um, and sort of the ones that are most useful are the, I would say the recent sets so of the effective one body models and the numerical relativity models. Um, these are used uh, extensively in, in LIGO when they do um, uh, parameter estimation using these models. Uh, the, the waveform generators themselves are too slow. Uh, certainly numerical relativity is an even effective one body for many um, problems under consideration. Uh, so surrogates have been built by various people to kind of accelerate the study. Uh, all of this previous work that I'm listing here has been restricted to mass ratios less than 10, 
Uh, so in some sense, this, this model that I'll be describing is a first look at extending uh, to higher mass ratios. Uh, why would we need to do this? So already with advanced LIGO, uh, it's not inconceivable to be seeing larger mass ratio uh, binary black hole systems. Um, and certainly future ground-based detectors will sort of see more of everything. Uh, but I, certainly one of the main targets of interest or, 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 or um, targets for extreme mass ratios say would be uh, something like a LISA space-based um, detector. Uh, so there are many challenges uh, to dealing with large mass ratios. Uh, one of the main ones is that waveform development has largely benefited from numerical relativity simulations. Uh, being able to run the numerical relativity codes at thousands of points in parameter space allows you to tune models in that regime. Uh, but numerical relativity is, is essentially incapable of doing anything beyond mass ratio of say 15 or 20 or so. Uh, it'd be a major breakthrough to have codes running uh, at mass ratios much beyond that, uh, certainly not hundreds or thousands. Um, also, LIGO waveforms are quite short, so all the, the waveform models that, that, that um, are needed in those studies don't have that many cycles, uh, so it's a little bit different for LISA. And so the main thing that we're kind of looking at here is how can surrogate modeling methodology that's worked uh, pretty well for LIGO type waveform be extended to LISA to, to, to handle the entire regime in spiral merger and ring down. Uh, so the model we're using uh, to collect our training data is coming from point particle perturbation theory. So this is sort of the standard framework for simulating emeries. Um, so at large enough mass ratios, you can sort of think of the smaller mass uh, perturbing object, given this figure here is a uh, kind of modeled by a Dirac delta function or point particle. And uh, this generates um, sort of fluctuations or metric perturbations about the background uh, per space time. And this leads to a, uh, a linearization of the Einstein equation. So um, the partial differential equations that are being solved in the computer to collect the training data are essentially uh, solving the Tucholsky equation. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the, uh, the framework. And then you have to have a model for the, the in-spiral of the, the, the perturbing orbit's trajectory. And for that, uh, we use, uh, it's, it's effectively, a, it's an adiabatic approximation where the in-spiral is driven by fluxes. Uh, interestingly enough, those fluxes were computed using Scott Hughes's Gremlin EQ code, which is part of this toolkit, uh, the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit. And uh, at some point, um, radiation reaction doesn't dominate and the, the sort of transitions into a plunge and there's a transition region. And this sort of describes the entire trajectory. Um, and then in order to get the waveform out at large values of R, we use hyperboidal uh, coordinates, which is sort of a trick to more or less formally put scry on the computational domain. Okay, so we run this code uh, at multiple mass ratios to collect our training data. And these are just sort of the two extremes shown here on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, so mass ratio three, even though that's by no means an extreme or even large mass ratio case, but you can nevertheless run the code at that mass ratio value and see what the waveform looks like. Uh, and there's the two, two mode there. And then at the other end of the, uh, the, the parameter domain, mass ratio of 10,000 is given down here on the bottom. Uh, so we sample this, this mass ratio space at 30 different values to collect their training data. Uh, so the surrogate model itself, so a lot of these, these formulas here are going to appear in the code in, in a bit. Um, this first line is basically just saying what we're modeling are the modes. So the, uh, the harmonic modes is, is what we're actually building surrogate models for. And so the full waveform is just given by this sum. So that's a pretty standard formula. And uh, we decompose this, again, this is not something that uh, we came up with. Many people decompose waveforms into amplitudes and phases because those are more slowly varying. And then we build models for these amplitude and phases. Uh, so in total, if we have to count how many things we need to approximate, uh, we use 11 harmonic modes. So these are the LM modes. So in total, there are 22 functions to approximate over time and, and mass ratio. Uh, so here's a kind of a cartoon of what this looks like. Um, so the top part here is describing, uh, I would say, steps one and two of the kind of the surrogate modeling recipe. Uh, so one of the steps is to uh, define model-specific basis functions. I'll come back to these in a second. Uh, that allow you to approximate anything that you want within this 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 range here of mass ratio. In this case, three to ten thousand, and over this time interval, uh, any amplitude or phases. So these are really targeted towards these particular uh, functions. And once you have that, uh, there are these special time nodes given in yellow. Uh, this basically allows you to, uh, it, 
effectively sample very sparsely in time uh, these sort of uh, amplitudes and phases or waveforms. And um, basically just from knowledge of the amplitudes and phases at these sparse time samples, you can reconstruct the entire time series. Uh, so that's sort of steps one and two. And then step three is uh, effectively just doing these kind of parametric fits or interpolants over the parameter space to get you the functional form of the, in this case, the amplitude uh, as a function of Q at some fixed time. So if you needed the new waveform that was not in the training set, uh, all you would need to do is know that mass ratio and evaluate um, these different fits at these times, these Xs here. And using this sort of model specific interpolant, you can reconstruct the entire time series. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna kind of briefly talk about these steps and then how it relates to the code in, in a second. Uh, so we're gonna mostly look at steps one and two using, in my opinion, a more illustrative example. So instead of imagining representing uh, or approximating the amplitudes and the phases, uh, we're gonna just approximate uh, H22 itself. So that's uh, somehow a little bit more uh, illustrative for this case. Uh, so step one is how to get a uh, custom kind of model specific basis. So there are algorithms for this. Uh, the two that we've used and explored in the past are greedy algorithms um, and something called the singular value decomposition. These are both ways of taking a bunch of model evaluations and then finding out uh, a set of compact basis functions that allow for uh, uh, representations just using a few basis. So for example, if you had your waveform, which is kind of actually in the bottom right-hand corner here, this is the maybe the, wave, the target waveform that we're trying to approximate. Um, and then we ask how well can we approximate it with two, four, or six of these model specific basis functions. Um, each column here kind of shows you how well you can do. So for example, if you, for whatever reason, you're only gonna use two basis functions. So this is basis function number two. Uh, notice it kind of looks like a waveform, but not quite. Um, since the basis are coming from the model itself, these basis functions will look like waveforms, but they're orthogonalized with respect to the previous basis functions through say a Gram-Schmidt. Um, so they don't quite look like basis or uh, waveforms themselves, but they're pretty close. So if you were gonna only use two basis functions and you wanted to represent your uh, H of T using those two, uh, well, you would just need to know C1 and C2. These are the coefficients of these basis functions. Uh, and you can get these through uh, various means, but for example, you could orthogonally project H onto this span of the space here of, of E1 and E2, and this is what you would get. Uh, it looks, doesn't look that good. Um, and by the time you add six basis functions, so you're gonna allow for your representation to have six unknown coefficients, you can completely construct the waveform <coughs> uh, just using uh, these six. At least in the, the eyeball norm, it looks pretty good. Um, okay, so that's sort of step one, getting a compact representation for uh, the data you're trying to approximate using model specific basis functions. Um, step two is to look for a more convenient representation. So here we have these constant C's, which I said you can get through orthogonal projection or something else. Um, turns out that's not the most convenient way of doing this. Uh, so a more convenient expression uh, is given as follows. So it turns out that um, if you have M basis functions, uh, there may, there usually exists uh, M time nodes, or uh, these could be interpolation time nodes, such that the information is preserved going from one picture to the other. So instead of representing our function in terms of linear combinations of these orthogonal bases, uh, where you'd have to know these coefficients C, if you could sample the waveform at the same, uh, I mean, the degrees of freedom freedom counting matches, here's an M here and an M here, uh, just sampling the waveform at these times, the information is sort of preserved in some uh, precise sense. So this is tricky to figure out what these times are because these basis functions are not, they're not sines and cosines, they're not polynomials. So all of the usual points that you would think to use when you'd open up numerical recipes, say what are the great, good points for interpolation don't really work here. Uh, it turns out that uh, in the sort of the 2009, 2010, um, people were looking at this and they de developed a way of picking the points um, so that you get good interpolation points. So that's, that's the, 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 the algorithm we use, it's called empirical interpolation. Uh, so the question is what are the best points for these empirical basis functions two, four, and six? Um, 
who knows because they're um, these are very non-standard. These are not classical functions or anything. So we let empirical interpolation pick them for us. Uh, and here, here it is here. So uh, these are the points that are picked by the algorithm. And um, we can kind of see that it does a couple of interesting things. It sort of puts the points where the regions of activity are. So without knowing where they were going to put the points, we would probably expect the boundaries um, are reasonable. And you can see there are points down here at the start and the end of the waveform. And there are also lots of points near the merger and the ring down. So it turns out that's sort of where the most information content is as far as the empirical interpolation algorithm is concerned. Um, for the purposes of approximating waveforms, we, we essentially just traded uh, this picture, which was less convenient, for this one here. So um, you can kind of think of this as a, uh, as a rotation in this, this approximation space uh, spanned by these EIs. Now they're the same approximation space spanned by these BIs. And now the coefficients are given by this uh, just evaluating the waveform at a couple of points. Okay, so that's step one and two, getting the basis and getting the points. And step three is we still have to approximate um, these, these certain pieces of data over the parameter space. Uh, so here in the, on the right, we're looking at data. This is the, um, the amplitude and the phase data for the 2-2 mode uh, over the training set. So this is from mass ratio three to 10,000. And um, mostly this picture is just showing us, well, one, how well we're, we're doing at this, but also the benefits uh, in this case of doing a logarithmic transformation of the independent variable Q. So for example, you can see, let's, I mean, for example, look at the bottom figure here. Um, if we just uh, used our data and plotted it just the regular spacing, so that's given by this, the, the blue curve and the, the blue uh, X axis kind of at the top here. Uh, it sort of has a very sharp feature. Um, and for many of the ways of approximating data that you would think of, interpolant, splines, uh, Gaussian process regression, uh, and representing the data this way was not uh, very uh, effective. Uh, the best errors we could typically get were, I mean, it's still good. The errors are, are 10 to the minus four, uh, but by doing a logarithmic transformation, we basically get two extra orders of magnitude for free. Uh, so this was, this was very helpful for dealing with larger uh, regions of the parameter space here. And similarly in phase, you can see there's quite an improvement by just re-representing the data in a slightly different way. Okay, so those are kind of a summary of the three steps. So uh, now that the model is built, we have to assess its accuracy. Um, so the main tool for this is something called cross-validation. Um, so cross-validation works as follows. Uh, so we have 30 waveforms in our training set. And uh, for each waveform, we hold out one. So imagine maybe mass ratio 100. We hold it out and we build a temporary or sometimes called trial surrogate using all of the other 29 uh, training waveforms. Um, so it doesn't see, it's not trained on that one that we've held out. And we evaluate this trial surrogate at this point, mass ratio 100, and then we compare its prediction to the actual data that we already have. And this process is repeated for all of the, uh, the mass ratios that we have in our training set. And uh, the hope is that since it's, it's sort of not trained on this, that the, the errors that we get through cross-validation uh, more or less makes honest predictions of the error uh, these different held out values. Um, okay, so here's sort of a summary of, of, of this um, and, a, and a bit more. Uh, so maybe the, the story actually starts down here at the bottom. Um, so here we're plotting, effectively it's a, it's a type of error, it's called the L2 error. Um, its definition is not that important, but the fact that the values are smaller good, and, and here we have mass ratio going from uh, three up to 10,000. And all of these different colored lines here with different line styles are the different modes. So, uh, so that we approximate 11 modes and you can kind of see how well the surrogate model is doing for each individual mode. And uh, you can also see that the 2-2 is not special. So some people think, oh, maybe you can approximate the 2-2 really well, but not the other ones. Uh, the 2-2 is pretty good. I mean, you can, you can kind of see it located in the, it's kind of the middle bottom part here, uh, but most of the other modes are pr pretty good as well. Um, there is some general trend where the errors get bigger as you move to the left here at smaller mass ratios. Uh, but mostly this model is, is, is best, most well suited to larger mass ratios uh, where perturbation theory is most accurate. Uh, so that would be kind of characterized by, by this regime out here. Um, the other bit is how well is it doing as compared to the training data itself. So we run the Tikolsky solver at two different 
resolution, grid resolutions and that allows us to estimate the numerical truncation errors. And that's given by these uh, orange pluses. And then we have to ask how well is our model doing compared to the orange pluses because that's how well we, how accurate we believe the data to be. Uh, so the leave one out cross validation study, which I mentioned before is given by these triangles here. Um, so it's, it's about a factor of 10 or 50 bigger or in some cases more, uh, but the errors are still pretty small. And the entire surrogate, so this is the error uh, compared to the training data, but now the surrogates trained on all 30 waveforms are given by these black dots here. Uh, the worst one is turned out to be mass ratio 150 and, and that these uh, waveforms and the amplitude and phases are uh, represented at the top here. Uh, so comparison to numerical relativity. So we, we, we want to do science with this model. And uh, we're well aware of the fact that perturbation theory doesn't work uh, so well at small to intermediate mass ratios. Um, and also even at high mass ratios for very long waveforms, um, we probably have to add in, do more than just um, an adiabatic approximations to the trajectory. Uh, but what we're after here is, uh, well, at least we have NR for simulations around less than 10. So we can at least check to see how well the, uh, the output of this Tucholsky solver is agreeing with numerical relativity solutions for less than 10. And at first thought, we probably would think this is a crazy thing to do because there's no reason to expect agreement. But, but actually somewhat recently, there've been uh, many authors, I, I believe this was started by um, Leif Tiek in around 2010 or 2011, uh, has found surprising agreement with various quantities that you can, you can um, basically, uh, compute both in NR and then in other theories like using a self-force calculation. Uh, and they seem to agree surprisingly well. Uh, so we're sort of doing this here for waveforms. And here's the result. Um, so initially when we just did this, we just compared NR, this is the blue curve to the red, uh, it wasn't that good. Uh, you can see there's some dephasing, the amplitude of the 2-2 mode is a bit bigger. And the L2 error, how well they're agreeing is, is almost order one. So there's, there's basically no accuracy here. Um, but then we, we kind of thought of different ways of making this comparison. And uh, one, one thing that we explored, which worked pretty well, uh, was to, to play around with the mass scale a bit. So uh, when you run a Tucholsky code, the mass scale is set by the mass scale of the background space time, which is set to one. Uh, but you have a small particle whose mass ratio is Q. So the total mass is effectively something like one plus one over Q. Um, in NR, that's sort of the thing that is used for the mass scale. So if you have two isolated black holes, you compute the Christodoulou masses of the two and add them together, and that's the, the mass of the background. Um, so what we did is we tried to um, come up with the rescaling of the total mass of the, of the, the, the perturbation theory calculation. Uh, and we didn't know what this was uh, from first principles, but we just said there's a factor alpha that shows up uh, like this here. And we'll, we'll find alpha by minimizing the difference between the Emory and the NR models. Uh, and when we do that, we generate this dashed curve. Uh, no, sorry, the dashed curve is the naive scaling, the one plus one over Q. Uh, we get these blue Xs here. And uh, if we were to rescale the, the Tucholsky solver output uh, by these alphas, uh, here's an example for Q equals eight. Now the agreement looks really well. Uh, the, we're in phase, the amplitude is sort of the right size. Uh, there's a little bit of dephasing down here, but again, this is Q equals eight. So there was really no reason to expect any kind of agreement whatsoever. Uh, and then the error is if you want to quantify it, it goes down by a factor of 70 or so. And so this figure here plots, for example, uh, the error in the 2-2 mode. You can see it's the error is decreasing as the mass ratio gets bigger is what you would expect because perturbation theory is doing a better job at describing the dynamics um, of, of, of the wave propagation. And here's all of the modes, so not just the 2, 2, but including all of the subdominant modes as well. Uh, the errors are going down and they're pretty small. So we call this the calibrated Emory model. And then finally, I guess I'm already kind of running short on time for this part here, but this is sort of the last slide. Um, in order to use, I mean, so the whole point of building these models in the first place is to enable uh, various kinds of things you need to do with data, parameter estimation, detection, and so on and so forth. Um, so in, th in this case, the, the thing that people like to do is work in the frequency domain where you have a noise weighted inner product where um, the weight is given by the power spectral density of the detector. And so here we've, and that's sometimes called the mismatch. Uh, so we plotted the mismatch versus the total mass for uh, a family of mass ratios. Now this is the mismatch between the calibrated Emory model 
and NR, because that's really the only data we have. We have no other way to really compare uh, models to what we would believe to be uh, good approximations um, to GR. And uh, you can see a couple of trends that you would expect. So for example, as the mass ratio uh, goes up, it goes from three to, to 10, uh, the errors, the mismatch is going down. Uh, and the other thing is the total mass is going up, the errors going up. Basically, this is a LIGO, an advanced LIGO noise curve. So as the total mass goes up, the merger and ring down, which is the harder part to model, sort of moves into the sensitivity bucket part. Uh, so that's kind of why the errors go up here. And uh, what we also did is we kind of looked at extrapolating these errors. So you can see they're going down. So we could ask, what does the mass ratio need to be so that it gets below this 10 to the minus 2 line, which is where uh, LIGO considers these to be accurate enough to sort of use in, a, in an analysis. Uh, we expect this to be around Q equals 15 or so. Um, OK, so that's sort of the first part, kind of an overview of the model, how it's built, and some of its, um, its, its accuracy assessments. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of running short on time, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, I kind of wanted to go to the code now. Uh, but maybe before moving directly to the code, is there any questions about this kind of first part, kind of the model part in the chat window? Uh, I think the, there were two, but the first one was, I assume, uh, answered during your talk. And the second mm -hmm. one is, is the alignment done at low frequency or at merger? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. I think, uh... Is the alignment done at low frequencies? Oh, merger. the alignment. Yeah. So the alignment is done at merger. Um, it's, it's basically following the same alignment scheme used for multi-mode NR surrogates. So where you, the maximum is defined to be the max of the entire power, not just the power in the two, two, but adding up all of the modes that's kind of defined as, as time zero. And then all the other times are, are based off of that. Okay, great. So, um, in order to, so this model was, was built using some other codes. Um, in fact, there was a lot of exploration so that the codes are, are in some sense quite unwieldy and, and spread out over many, many um, different Jupyter notebooks. But at the end of the day, we have one file and um, one set of codes to evaluate it. And that was, has been coded up in, um, in uh, this Emory surrogate uh, uh, project here. So this is the code tutorial part. So I'll point out, so if you've, everyone did their homework um, over the last 25 minutes or so, uh, you should have all of the necessary packages. And I'll just point out again, the other thing we need is this, um, this, this H5 file. Um, so if you, you can grab this and uh, that is hosted here on uh, Zenodo. So you can see here that um, in, this, is the, uh, this is one way to track and sort of preserve data integrity. Um, there are probably other ways as well, but this is where we decided to put the, the code here or the, uh, the data. Uh, and here's the data file. So you can also click on this download button. Um, okay, so, so, so the notebook, so I'll just say the, the, the tutorial notebook, I've uploaded it to, I mean, it's probably in a couple of places now, but one place to get it would just be from the code repository itself, this Emory surrogate uh, project here. So if you, if you download or you clone it, you're immediately gonna get the notebook as well. And uh, I'm gonna sort of walk through the notebook, not in notebook mode, but in uh, slide view mode. Um, but all of these slides are effectively cells. So you can sort of follow along and execute cells. Uh, so the first thing to note is that in order to use this model, uh, the notebook uh, and this, I, I mean, this is, there's only one piece of Python code here, uh, emory sir load.py that will load the model, evaluate the model and apply this alpha, um, adjustment that I was just describing. Uh, so the notebook, this file, and the HDF5 file should all be in the same directory. And uh, otherwise, it won't work. Uh, actually, what, one of many things that we could improve upon would be allowing the H5 file to be located somewhere else. Um, so that's, uh, if, you, if you find that to be a useful feature, you can open up an, an issue, and we can take a look at it. Uh, oh, and if you're wondering about where to do that, um, you can see here on the, on the page, there's an issues tracker. And uh, I opened up an issue uh, last night because I was kind of frustrated that I couldn't toggle between the Emory and the Tucholsky solver surrogate. So if you find other issues that you would like or if things break, you can add these to the list here and we'll try to, try to get through the chores as they come in. Uh, okay, so this is what I've already mentioned. You should basically have the Python packages and Jupyter notebooks. 
Uh, and then if you don't have Git installed, the no Git fallback plan would just be to download the zip file uh, and, and open it on your laptop. So if everything went well, one of the first blocks of code that you'll be executing will be this one. Um, and if this runs, basically everything should be working, uh, or at least all of the main packages that you'll need will be there. Uh, so the first thing to talk about is the data file. So the data file, uh, again, this is the data file that's hosted on Zenodo. Um, this, I mean, so surrogate models are, are, are not like regular models in the sense that most models have either analytic expressions or they come by solving differential equations. Uh, surrogates are effectively defined by lots of data. So uh, in order to run a surrogate model, you basically need, always would need some data plus code uh, that loads the data and does something useful with it uh, that gives you the model evaluation. Um, so that's the first part. We're going to take a look at the data file. Uh, the one thing to notice is that the data files may change. So for example, in the future, we may build longer Emory surrogates. Uh, they may cover longer mass ratios. We may find a bug. And anytime a change to the data file happens, we'll have to update Zenodo. So Zenodo conveniently lists, for example, um, I'll come back to this page here, uh, the hash. So each time there's a, a file, there's an associated hash. Uh, that's a unique identifier for the file. And so even though the file's name may not change, uh, updates to the file will change the hash. So before using this package, you wanna make sure you're using the, most, the latest data file. Otherwise, uh, you may not be getting whatever bug fixes or extensions and improvements have been made. Uh, so one way to check this would be, if you wanted to do it uh, kind of manually, would be um, to do it in the Jupyter Notebook, which is what we'll see in a second. But inside the code itself, it, it will take the, uh, the file that you've downloaded, compute the hash, and compare it to the current hash on Zenodo. And if these are out of date, there should be a, an error message thrown so you don't use old files. Uh, you can also check this yourself, just, I mean, good for data integrity if the download went through or something, uh, by running this block of code, and then you should get a hash at the bottom here, which then you can check uh, with what's on Zenodo to make sure it's, it's up to date and correct. Uh, so that's kind of a first step. Uh, and then once you believe that the data file is correct and that it's in the same directory as emrysirload.py, uh, now you can run this step, and uh, this, this won't run unless the data file is located um, in this same folder, uh, because one of the first things that happens when you try to import the Emory surrogate uh, package is it will attempt to load the data file. Uh, okay, so uh, a bit about the data file structure. So the structure closely mimics, mirrors the, uh, the way that the surrogate is built. So for example, I said what we, we model are the modes, and there are 11 modes. Uh, these are the HLMs. And each mode has an amplitude and phase data piece, which is independently modeled. And these are represented as, as I mentioned before, something called empirical interpolants with parametric fits. Uh, so we want to, if for, for whatever reason, you need to know what those values are or the basis or so on, uh, where are these living in the data file. So if you were to open the data files, so this is where the h5pi library comes in handy. Uh, you can open it, open it up and then you can start to look at it. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I realize there's a sort of a broad range of uh, people on, on, on the call um, so I'll just kind of mention that what this is, uh, this FP here, this is a, I mean, it's a file pointer, but you can treat it like a, a dictionary, a Python dictionary. And these dictionaries have keys and the keys have values. And um, HDF5 files, you basically should view these, and these are very similar to um, Unix directory structures. They're kind of like trees. And so when we call, for example, in this first line, uh, Emory surrogate data groups, fp.keys, we're asking what are effectively the groups or the directories right under the, the top part of the file here. So this is kind of the highest level. And we can see all of the data groups um, are give, are given by these keys are the different LM modes. So each, each group is its own surrogate for each mode. And inside that, for example, if we wanted to take a look at what's going inside the, the 2.2, L2M2, two, two, uh, the 2.2 mode also has many data groups, and this, can, this has all of the data we need to evaluate the 2.2 model. And so, for example, there's something called B, B phase, degree, and so on and so forth. Uh, so each LM mode, if you were to, for example, want to know what's inside the data group 5.5, you should see all of the same stuff. And that's because each mode is built uh, sort of the same way. Uh, so just looking a little bit closer at the 2.2 uh, the mode, the amplitude for the 2.2 mode, uh, basically, these are the main... Uh, keys that you'll find and sort of what they mean. 
So for example, earlier I was talking about the basis and the empirical interpolation times. Uh, that information is stored in uh, what's unfortunately just called B. Um, it should have been called B underscore amp, but this is due to a choice that was made a long time ago about naming conventions. Uh, so that's, that's what we have here. And EIM indices, these are the location of the empirical nodes for the amplitude, which is separate from the phase. These are, these are two separate data groups. Um, so that's information about the empirical interpolant. And then uh, the fits, the parametric fits, they actually need a little bit more information. So for example, how is the parameterization being done in this case, we're modeling the data using spline. So what are the spline knots, which is basically the location of the, of the spline nodes, uh, the degree and so on and so forth. So all of that information is stored in all of these, uh, these, these, these data, data sets. Um, so for example, if you wanted to uh, build empirical interpolants directly from the data without kind of using the code, uh, you would need to get this B basis matrix that's located here. Uh, this is an equation kind of from what we saw before. And you would need to get the EIM indices and that sort of gives you the values of these T EIMs here. Uh, and then you can reassemble the empirical interpolant using this formula. We'll see that in a second. Uh, so you can look at the bases and see what they look like. Um, they're not that exciting, um, I, I, in my opinion. <laughs> and most people probably won't need to look at them but I'm just pointing out where they are. And so for example, the zeroth basis is the most important. It's the one that carries the information content um, and you can and see what it looks like. It kind of looks like an amplitude maybe, uh, but there's certainly some differences going on here near merger. Um, and then we can also ask where are the empirical interpolation nodes uh, directly from using the data uh, itself. Um, so for example, if we get the EIM nodes uh, for the 2-2 mode and plot them on top of, uh, and we've just plotted here the zeroth basis just kind of for reference, you can see where the algorithm decided to choose points. There's one point at the very beginning and lots of points near the merger and the ring down portion. Um, there are no points in between. So that means you, as far as the empirical interpolant is concerned, you do not need to know what the amplitude's value is anywhere in this region here in order to reconstruct values in that region. That's just done through uh, the, the basis functions. And if we zoom in on the activity over here to kind of see what's going on. Uh, so here's a zoom in plot, which guess is running off the screen. So I'm gonna to try to change the view. Here it is here. Uh, so here's the merger at, at t equals zero. Uh, and there are a couple of points before the merger and there are a bunch of points around the merger and right after the merger. Uh, there's also no points after this last one here. So I guess effectively speaking, the empirical interpolant is extrapolating into the deep ring down portion, uh, but that's okay because it's doing it accurately. I mean, that's exactly how the algorithms are tuned to make to guarantee accuracy. So it's just saying it doesn't need any information in that region to be able to predict it. Uh, okay, so evaluating the model is the thing that most people will care about because this is where you would, uh, this is what you would do in order to uh, do parameter estimation studies say. Uh, so the input to the model is just the mass ratio Q because for now this is just a one dimensional non-spinning uh, binary black hole. And optionally you can decide what modes you want to generate. So if you don't want to generate all 11 modes you can decide which ones you want, but by default, you'll get them all back. Uh, and the output will be a dictionary of modes. We'll see what that is in a second. And this is sort of just in standard dimensionless geometric units. So there's no uh, really units associated with the time or the, uh, or the strain H. Uh, so here's an example. So if you have mass ratio 10, um, I just picked one mass ratio that's sort of small because uh, it's something you could compare to NR in principle. And uh, so here's where we're actually evaluating the model in this line here. And we're just passing in the mass ratio Q because we want all of the modes. And at this point, if we want to plot individual modes, we're gonna have to uh, go get them from the dictionary. So the dictionary's keys are um, something called a tuple. So if you pass in a parenthesis two comma two, that's a, a, a tuple, two two or two one. And uh, what you'll get back is a uh, effectively something like a numpy array. Uh, that you can then plot. And so we can plot down here for the 2-2 two, two mode and the 2-1 mode, uh, the dimensionless waveform. Okay, um, so that, that is, I mean, th this is very useful for many things already, uh, the, the, the sort of the dimensionless form. But if you want physical waveforms, something that the detector would see, uh, at least currently there's no mechanism for doing this directly within the Emory surrogate package, although I think it'd be pretty easy to add and probably a useful feature uh, for, for down the road. 
Um, but for now, I, I basically just in this, this cell here added in all the necessary uh, units that we need to convert to sort of MKS type units. Um, if they have all this stuff here, and we're choosing at this point uh, a total mass of 80, 80 solar masses. Uh, we have some distance in terms of parsecs. Um, and then here we're doing the scaling to go from the dimensionless to the dimension full waveform, and then we can plot it down here. So if you were to use this for some kind of an analysis, you would you'd want to have these extra couple of steps in order to get dimension full waveforms. Um, okay, and oh good, I think I'm, I'm pretty good on time, I guess, and only one or two slides left. Um, okay, and the other thing is I mentioned that there are two, effectively two surrogates. So there's the underlying surrogate, which is the output from the Tikolsky solver. Uh, that's really what the surrogate is, is trained on. And, and for the purposes of this slide, I'll just denote that H of S, that's the surrogate model. Uh, it's coming from the per perturbation theory framework. Uh, the Emery surrogate, what we're calling the Emery surrogate, is the one that's calibrated to NR at near comparable mass ratio uh, binaries. And we have this single parameter alpha. Um, so they're related according to this, this formula here. And so when you're running the code, you, you basically get the calibrated model. Um, for some purposes, you may not want that. You may want the underlying output from the Tikolsky solver. For example, if you yourself are building a Tikolsky solver, and you want to check, for example, how is my code working well or not, um, you could in principle compare against these waveforms and that would be a reasonable sanity test perhaps for the code. I mean, there could be other purposes as well, but that's just one thing I'm, I'm just thinking about. Uh, so in order to do that, you have to find out where in the code uh, this is happening. And there are basically two spots. So we're scaling H and we're scaling time, uh, T. And so you would just basically find these lines 110 and 118 and where it says alpha, and there's this whole expression here, uh, just set that to one. And if you were to do that, then you would be getting the, the output from the Tikolsky solver. Um, oh yeah, that's just shown here. So also this is a, clearly not what we would want the user to do. It'd be better to have a way to, when you call the model, have a Boolean that says true, false, which, which one do you want, calibration or not? Uh, so that's why I opened up an issue on the issue tracker, because I think that's something that should probably be modified and be pretty easy to do. Okay, so I guess that's uh, that's pretty much all I had. Um, yes, in about 45 minutes. So yeah, that's basically it. So here's some summary slides. Um, there's one other notebook in addition to the one that I showed um, that you can find on, 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 on the project page. Uh, hopefully we'll be adding more models. So as the models get longer, uh, they maybe include more physics. Uh, we would update this model or include others uh, and we plan on, on making this all available through the Black Hole Perturbation Toolkit. And as people start using these models, open up issues, we'll try to get to them as, I mean, we, uh, as quickly as we can, <laughs> although there's no promise of turnaround times. And a couple of features that would be nice to have. I mean, so I think the model evaluations should be faster. Uh, other code that we have is, is basically within uh, milliseconds it will run. But if you've run these codes on your laptop, you will probably have seen that there, these are order of seconds. Um, I, we haven't really figured out what the difference is, but I think in principle, this would be easy to do using a profiler. We will add that. And if people are using these models, say for different kinds of data analysis studies, we would probably want the models call signature to match things that people are familiar with like law simulation. Uh, so that's something we could certainly look into adding and then making the code more flexible now. So when newer models come online, um, they can kind of be quickly dropped into place. Um, okay, so I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any any questions anyone has. Thank you. So thank you very much. We have time just for one question. Unfortunately, there is one question. Oh, so, okay, what is the smaller or larger mass ratio to uh, numerical relativity SC, uh, S, uh, time, uh, S simulation cover or can go to? Oh, sorry, I don't think I, I caught that. Uh, yeah. So what is the smaller or la larger mass ratio Q that NRSXS simulations cover or can go to? Oh, okay, okay, I see. Um, yeah, so basically they can uh, more or less go for, I mean, this is non-spinning, mind you. So if we are adding in spin here, the, the answer would change. But um, for non-spinning, it can go from mass ratio one up to 10 have been, I mean, there have been many simulations in this regime. Uh, that's why we use one to 10. 
My understanding is that there have been some recent developments in the way they effectively the, the, the gauge is uh, set in that code where they've, they've pushed it a little bit higher. But um, I mean, we're not talking like mass ratio of, of many tens or something. I think it's been extended a little bit beyond 10. Um, so that, that more or less, I think 10, up to 10 is a safe, a safe range. Beyond that, I think it's somewhat experimental and they're still looking into it, but uh, maybe 15 or 20 will be possible in the nearest future. Uh, the second one is how the performance, uh, they ask the performance for Q is equal one. Ah, <laughs> for the Emory model, we never, so actually I, I think Gaurav Khan is on the call. He may know this better than, than I do because he, it means it, it's, he's been the one developing and wrote all of the Tikolsky solving code. My understanding is that as you get closer to mass ratio one, certain issues arise with the Ori Thorne transition when you go from in spiral. I mean, so you could certainly just run the code and see what happens, but the waveforms begin to look unphysical. Um, we would expect the amplitude and phase to be monotonically increasing. And this didn't appear to be the case when you start going to mass ratio two and one using the Tikolsky solver. Uh, but that's, that's largely due to this, this effect, the, the Ori Thorne transition that happens before the plunge. <laughs> yeah, quickly, so I think just repeating what Scott said, that's true, that's exactly what happens. And we really didn't do any testing uh, at mass ratios less than three. Uh, with some effort, we could try to do better, um, but at the moment, things break pretty badly. Uh, um, so yeah, we have to move to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, so Leo, are you ready? Hey, can everybody hear me? Yeah, yes, we do. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. All right. Um, so thanks everybody for sticking with us to the end. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the other Python packages, uh, which is this package for computing quasi-normal mode frequencies and separation constants and spherical spheroidal mixing coefficients, uh, which also Niels mentioned in different language uh, in his talk. Um, so this is a Python package. You, pro you might have Python installed already. Um, if you do, then you can install this package through pip or conda. We'll get to that in a second. But if you don't, you can go to uh, this URL. By the way, is the font size OK, or do I need to increase it? I think it's fine. OK. Um, yeah, so, so you can run this uh, Colab notebook on one of Google's servers if you don't want to install anything yourself. Um, so you can follow along. So this notebook that you're seeing right now, which you get if you click, if you go to this link, which is also on the, uh, the agenda, um, uh, right now I'm the only one who, who can edit it, but uh, you should get a button up here that says something like um, uh, open in playground or save to my drive or something like that. And then you'll be able to edit it and run it yourself. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, and this notebook has a bunch of empty code. Uh, I'm going to like go back and forth between some math and the code itself. Um, so anywhere where you see it to do, so you can't just run this top to bottom because there's a bunch of places where there's code uh, needed to fill in. And I'm gonna fill that in. Okay, so, um, oops. So here are just uh, all of the links. Uh, okay, actually before the links, um, here's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, uh, some info about the code, how to install it, uh, a little bit of theory about the angular and radial separation of the Tucholsky equation uh, with code examples for each of those, um, how to root find to consistently solve both of them at the same time. And then uh, what's kind of at the heart of doing this consistently, uh, which is following a, uh, a, fam a particular quasi-normal mode family up in spin from the Schwarzschild case where we know 
which mode we're talking about to higher spins where the different modes might trade places. Um, and you'll see that in a minute. Uh, and then some, some more uh, info about the code. Uh, there's caching, so you don't have to recalculate stuff. OK, so uh, we don't need this outline anymore. Um, so this is where you can find everything. And most of these uh, links link to each other. So everything is on GitHub. Uh, if you find any bugs, please open an issue or send me a pull request. Uh, and possibly the most useful one of these links is on read the docs. These docs are automatically generated from the code itself. So if you go to read the docs, then you'll also see like the uh, API for all of the functions. So if you want to know like what are the arguments for calling something, uh, it's all automatically documented. This is also available interactively because uh, this documentation is just generated from the doc strings in the Python. Okay, so let me get some more screen real estate. Okay, so um, if you end up using this code, then uh, please cite the, um, the paper, which is in the Journal of Open Source Software, uh, which by the way, this is the first time that I had an experience with the Journal of Open Source Software. The review process is all done on a GitHub issue. So that's pretty cool. So everybody can look at what happened during the refereeing process. Okay, so if you're planning on installing this code locally, you can do it either with pip or with conda with the usual ways of installing a package in pip or conda. Um, and this is on conda forge because it's not an official part of Anaconda, but you know, just add the conda forge channel. Um, now, uh, if you do a pip install or a conda install, it'll automatically install a whole bunch of other things that you need, um, like numpy and scipy for standard numerical methods. There's this nice package called Numba, which does just-in-time compilation. So the first time that you load the package, uh, it's going to execute a little bit of code, um, the like most commonly used code path. Um, and that's going to just in time compile these functions and then cache them to disk. So that from that point on, every time you reload the package, it doesn't need to recompile the code. Uh, and, and it'll, uh, you know, these tight inner loops are going to basically run at C speed, even though it's a Python code. Um, and so the approach in this code uh, is uh, more or less following what's, in, what's done in the Cook and Zalutsky paper of 2014. Uh, that is the angular sector of the Tikolsky equation is solved spectrally, and the radial uh, sector is solved with continued fractions. And you track quasi-normal modes uh, starting at Schwarzschild and then going up in spin um, to make sure that you preserve a continuous ordering uh, so, that, so that all the frequencies are continuous with spin, even if they uh, change where they are located in the complex plane. Um, now, of course, Quasi-normal quasi mode frequencies and separation constants and these mixing coefficients don't change. Um, you know, they're the same for every Schwarzschild black hole of a certain spin. So we don't actually need to, uh, to recompute this every time. So we can just cache it to disk, uh, at least a coarse uh, set of the data. And then you can use that cache so that later, if you want to uh, compute at some new value of spin that's not in the cache, you have a good starting point. Uh, uh, you can interpolate uh, to get a good starting point, and then you can polish the root. Um, OK. So uh, let's get into um, the most uh, high level usage of the package. So on this Colab notebook, this environment was launched bare. So I have to do a pip install on their servers and it's installing the package. So it installed it. Um, so just the first time you import it, it's doing a just-in-time compilation. This takes a few seconds. Um, so now if I restarted this virtual machine, um, it would not need to do that uh, import because it's already got it written to disk. Now the, this cached data is about 100 megs compressed and it's sitting on my server. Um, there's a function download data let me move this down here. So download data 
will fetch this data and decompress it for you so that you can use it. So you don't have to regenerate the cache because the default cache takes about 15 minutes to calculate. So uh, if everybody is doing this right now, then uh, it might be kind of a load on my server, but it's only 100 megs. So we can wait a second. Okay, and uh, this function won't re-download unless you force it to. Um, so if I ran this next cell, well, it's waiting to decompress. Um, okay, so decompressed, there are 860 modes cached. And if you run this again, then it doesn't do anything because it detects that you've already got a cache. All right, so the highest level usage is by this function called QNM modes cache, qnm.modes underscore cache, which is a cache object. And you use it by specifying a spin weight. Um, so currently, minus two and minus one are included in the cache and uh, an L, M and N for the spherical harmonics that you're interested in. So let's just get the one that you care about the most if you're doing LIGO data analysis or something, which is the gravitational two to zero mode. And that is an object which acts like a function. So we can call it at some given value of spin. So let's say we wanted a spin of 0.68. Uh, and what it returns is the frequency, the separation constant A, and this, uh, this vector C. And uh, this vector C is a decomposition, which we'll talk about when we get to the angular sector, uh, decomposition of the spin-weighted spheroidal harmonic for whatever this frequency is for the correct frequency uh, into the basis of spin-weighted spherical harmonics. So Neil's already mentioned this in his talk. Um, okay, so uh, this, uh, this is indexed by uh, the L numbers and the L numbers, uh, of course, they start at um, the minimum uh, of S or M, sorry, the maximum of absolute value of S or M so if you, this is just a convenience function to make sure you don't uh, get the uh, indexing wrong. So this should be appropriate for the S equals minus two, L equals two, M equals two. Uh, oh, sorry, this does, uh, S equals minus two, M equals two. And we went up to a certain L max in the decomposition which is available in this object. So by the way, I recommend that you use uh, named arguments for your Python functions so that if the API changes and the order changes or something like that, this type of thing won't break. All right, so this is how to make sure that you know which L corresponds to which component of C. All right, uh, and, and you can change how many Ls uh, you're keeping in the expansion later. All right, so that's if you, um, Basically, if you already know what you want and you just want these values of omega a and c and the l's that, that are in this decomposition so that you know which spin-weighted spherical harmonics to add up, uh, this will get you going. So the rest of the talk is digging into the details, kind of going in, starting at the low level of um, uh, how this code is built and working our way up to this highest level that you just saw. So we're interested in quasi-normal modes. So this is, uh, these are solutions to the source-free Tucholsky equation. So this is the Tucholsky equation for curvature perturbations. We're considering no source on the right-hand side. So after the small body has plunged into the black hole or after two comparable mass black holes have merged and you just have one black hole left over. And the Tucholsky operator is some complicated thing but because Kerr is magic, it separates with this ansatz where you have the symmetry adapted basis for uh, the uh, azimuthal symmetry and the stationarity. And then there's some function for the angular and the radial sector. And this actually separates into the radial and angular equations below. And that separation has a separation constant and an unknown frequency. And you have to solve for both of those simultaneously. Okay. so. Uh, in the angular sector, um, now I'm using, I guess the X here is what Martin was calling the Z. 
uh, which is cosine of theta. And the C parameter here is what Niels was calling gamma. That's just A omega. So this is the um, spheroidal equation, which is a deformation of uh, the Legendre equation. Um, and we have some regularity conditions at the poles at z equals zero, at x equals zero, and x, uh, sorry, x equals one and x equals minus one. Um, and so, you know, the, there, there are a lot of different ways to solve this. Uh, you can use Lever's method going from either of those singular points at the ends, uh, or you can use an expansion in spin weighted spherical harmonics, which are a solution to this equation when c equals zero. And um, the, the approach that's used in this package is the spectral approach because it has exponential convergence. And I don't know, we should probably talk about this later. There's already been discussion um, in, the, uh, in one of the other Slack channels. Okay, so if you, if you take uh, your putative solution and you expand it in the basis of these spin-weighted spherical harmonics, that is with C equals zero, then we have a vector of coefficients C uh, for this expansion. And uh, once you let this differential operator act on this expansion, um, then you know how it acts on all of the C equals zero basis functions, these uh, spin-weighted spherical functions. And that, that can just be written as a matrix acting on a vector of the C coefficients equals the unknown separation constant that we want to solve for. That's one of the pieces of data that we want to solve for acting on C. Now, what I didn't mention here is that this matrix depends on omega. So to solve uh, this equation, you have to assume some omega and then you can find a whole bunch of eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this problem. But if, if somebody gives you an omega, uh, then you know, and then you just truncate this expansion at some L max, which depends on uh, the problem at hand, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and you can just solve the matrix, uh, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here's an example of doing this. So this is what's going on in qnm.angular. So qnm.angular has a function to build the M matrix. Uh, and this is a, a function that is uh, just in time compiled. Um, so if we want to build the M matrix, qnm.angular.m matrix, we need to give it a value of S, C, M, and L max. And I already filled in, um, I just put a bunch of, of uh, default values up here. Um, so all we had to do is fill in these arguments. Okay, so constructed this matrix. Uh, here's just one row of the matrix. Uh, it's actually a sparse matrix, it's pentadiagonal. Uh, it only has five non-vanishing uh, diagonals. Uh, so using an adapted um, sparse matrix solver would probably be ideal, um, but I'm just using the built-in eigenvalue solver. So I don't know what it's doing inside. It's doing something dense. Uh, anyway, let's look at this matrix. Um, so here on the left and on the right are the real and the imaginary parts of this matrix with colors encoding how large these values are. You see that it's, well, it's pentadiagonal. Um, so it's dominated along the diagonal. So it's actually very, a very easy eigenvalue problem to solve. Um, okay. So the functions that you might end up using in qnm.angular are the functions sepconsts, which for a given choice of parameters will tell you what all of the separation constants are. That's all of the eigenvalues. And typically when we're solving for a quasi-normal mode frequency, we're looking for a specific one because we're doing this, this procedure of tracking along a family with A increasing. So we have a good guess of a separation constant from earlier in the sequence. So you're looking for a specific quasi-normal mode uh, or a specific separation constant that is closest to some known guess. So that's subconst closest. And then if you want both the eigenvector and the eigenvalue, then that's C and subconst closest. So let's look at the documentation for these. Um, uh, this, uh, this function accepts the spin weight 
uh, the oblateness parameter, the, uh, the azimuthal number, and a, basically a size for the matrix, what L to go up to. So using the values above, uh, this is all of the separation constants that we got. Uh, if you're already familiar with curve perturbation theory, then you're aware that these are close to the values for C equals zero. These are just small deformations away from uh, the C equals zero values. Okay, and, and uh, the one that gets used in coupling the angular and radial sectors together are C and subcons closest. So here we need a guess. We need a value of A zero. And you can get that guess from, let's say for example, um, the, uh, the spherical eigenvalue. Uh, so, because those are analytically known. So this is just an analytic function that just gives us SS plus one minus L, L plus one. Uh, and we, we can use that as a guess for qnm.angular.c and subcons closest. And so we need to give it an A zero. We need to give it an S. Let's use the same values as before. Uh, we need to give it an M and we need to give it an L max. Okay, so this is the separation constant and this is the vector of uh, mixing coefficients or decomposition of the spheroidal into the spherical. All right, so what's good about the, uh, the spectral decomposition is that you get exponential convergence. So just to show that, um, here is building one of these matrices and getting all of the A's and all of the C's. And then let's look at the magnitude of the decomposition for all of these different modes. So this is on a log lin plot. So you can see that um, uh, all of these above some point are decaying exponentially. So you get exponential convergence of this decomposition. And the rate of convergence depends on the value of A omega. Um, so that's something that should in principle be chosen uh, automatically. Right now it's not. So that's a potential room for improvement. Uh, so what else you see, the other thing that you see here is that for each L mode, uh, you get a peak in the decomposition at the L prime coefficient equal to L. So uh, there's not actually that much mixing. Uh, the spheroidals are almost the same as the sphericals. Um, okay, good. So let's move on to the radial sector. So this is the radial Tucholsky equation. Uh, we've already seen this before. So now in the radial Tucholsky equation, we can also think of this as uh, an eigenvalue problem and subject to the physical boundary conditions where we only want radiation going out at infinity and down the horizon, not coming out of the horizon and nothing coming in from scry minus, um, the, the uh, eigenvalue of this equation will also be uh, discretized. Um, now here, okay, both the separation constant and the unknown frequency appear here, but the separation constant is a function of the frequency. So uh, if you picked a particular frequency, it would specify a separation constant um, and you would know whether or not uh, that choice of frequency does or does not satisfy the boundary conditions. So the condition, the, so satisfying the boundary conditions or not is usually done from this Frobenius expansion about the singular points at the endpoints of the domain. Um, so if you look at Lever's paper, um, there's this Frobenius expansion, and there are these indices, and you only get um, the physical boundary conditions for certain choices. Uh, now these three-term recurrence relations that you get have two solutions. There's the minimal solution and there's the dominant solution, which has exponential blow up. So we want to reject the dominant solution. And that was Lever's great contribution, which is that if you want to only get the minimal solution, you can enforce that by rewriting your recurrence relation as an infinite continued fraction. So this basically pushes you, sta stably numerically pushes you towards only the minimal solution. So there's this infinite continued fraction with these alpha, beta, gamma coefficients, which Lever first wrote down. And these coefficients are all functions of, well, which coefficient number you're on, the spin of the black hole, the spin weight of the field, the azimuthal number, whatever the unknown frequency is, and the corresponding separation constant for that frequency. Now, 
So this is an equation that has to be satisfied for these complex omegas. So um, there are an infinite number of roots in the complex plane for this frequency. It's not a polynomial. Um, and actually you can take the same equation and manipulate it into what's called uh, the nth inversion of the continued fraction. So you just do some algebra. So if you assume this was true, you know, move this to the other side, multi divide, uh, take the reciprocal, keep going. And so you can come up with a bunch of different inversions. So we can take this, the starred equation, the nth inversion of the continued fraction. This is a complex function of omega in the complex omega plane. And what we wanna do is locate the zeros of the right-hand side. So we call this the error function. This is what I'm calling CF, the error function of omega with all of these parameters. Um, so we need to do infinite continued fractions in this code. Um, so uh, you can't really do an infinite number of calculations on the computer. Um, so I use Lentz's method to automatically terminate the calculation of the continued fraction um, when it detects that it's reached a certain tolerance. So this is implemented in the qnm.continued.contfrac module. Um, so what you need to give a continued fraction is a, a pair of functions a and b where you, you call them with an integer n and they will return to you the corresponding number in the numerator or denominator in the nth term. So this is the continued exp uh, fraction expansion for uh, just the number e. Uh, it has, you know, uh, just a one in the first term and n minus one in every nth term after that. And the b function has a two in the zeroth term and an n in every function after that. And so we can evaluate this and you see that it took 16 evaluations to get to uh, below the desired tolerance. Okay, so this is a general purpose function. Um, I, I actually found that uh, because I wanted this to be a general function, this, this function is not just in time compiled, which means that you don't get a speed up. So instead I inlined the continued fraction into the lever solver, which is in the radial sector. So in the radial sector, uh, the continued fraction solver is already inside this function called qnm.radial.lever continued fraction whatever inversion using the Lentz method. So this is the signature for the function. Uh, it's going to take an omega and compute the right-hand side, which is what we want to be zero, but in most places in the complex plane, it's not zero, and all of the other parameters. So um, let's turn it into a univariate function just for a bunch of uh, values of these parameters so that we can look at it in the complex plane. So, um, what I'm going to do is, is get, is I'm going to look at my cheat sheet so I remember what I was going to do here. Um, all right, so what I wanna do is to find the correct um, separation constant to a given omega, but remember that sepconst closest needs, oops, Subconst closest needs a value of a zero. Um, so that's the value above. Um, so we'll start with uh, the analytic value for um, start with the analytic value for uh, the, the spin weighted spherical harmonic. Uh, so that's swish spherical H A. Uh, with S, L, and M. Okay, so that gives us A, which is a required input for qnm.radial.lever CF inverse lengths. And now this needs a whole bunch of arguments. It needs omega. Uh, it needs, actually, let me name these omega, A, S, M, A, the A that we computed on the previous line, the inversion number, which we'll talk about in a bit. 
So heuristically, the nth inversion number is best for finding um, the nth overtone. And uh, let's just cut off the number of uh, continued frac number of terms that we keep in the continued fraction. All right. Let me make sure I did everything right. A S M A N inversion. Okay, great. All right, so this is a function. We can, uh, now it's just a univariate function. We can evaluate it. It's just some number. I, it's at some point in the complex plane where it's not zero. So that's not a quasi-normal mode. So let's just uh, choose a hundred by hundred grid in the complex plane and uh, evaluate this function over all of those complex omegas. This takes a few seconds. Okay, great. It took two and a half seconds to do that. And now let's plot the amplitude and phase of this error function in the complex plane. So you might've seen plots like this before. On the left is one over the amplitude to try to highlight the location of the roots. Each of those bright spots is one of the roots of this, um, of this error function. And on the right-hand side is the phase, the complex phase. So at each of the roots, um, the phase uh, going around that root um, goes through two pi. So you can see there's a root, there's another root, there's a circle there, there's another root, there's a circle there, there's another root there, and so on. I think there's one up there, and there's another one down here, um, which is kind of suppressed because we're looking at a certain inversion number. Uh, okay, so I need to speed up a bit. All right, so, so this is just a complex function. You can think of it as a, a as a pair of real functions with two real inputs. Uh, and of course, SciPy already has code for finding roots of such functions. So we can rely on SciPy to root solve in the complex plane. So the, uh, the class that implements that is called nearby root finder. Um, and so you can build a nearby root finder object qnm.nearby.nearby root finder, and it needs a whole bunch of arguments. Uh, Got to look at my cheat sheet again. All right, so we're going to uh, try to root find at the specific value of a up here um, for the spin weight, this as a muthal number using however many, uh, however many terms and spectral expansion we needed and a closest to, um, we're just going to use a zero as a guess. And we also need to give it an initial guess for the value of omega. So, uh, you know, I already know where this root is. So I'm gonna put in a guess that's nearby and then the inversion number of the error function that we use is an inv, which is two. So we just built a finder object. And with this finder ob object, you just do a dot do solve and it'll call the scipy root finding routines and find uh, the location of the root in the complex plane that's close to your initial guess. So, um, so the root finder has its own tolerance. There are two tolerances here, right? There's the tolerance for the uh, continued fraction expansion to converge. That's like the, if you made a plot of uh, the value of the error function versus omega, then that's the vertical error. And then the root finder has a horizontal error, which is the tolerance with which you want to find the value of omega. Those two values should in principle be linked to each other if you knew the slope d omega by, sorry, d error function by d omega. So that's another avenue for potential future work. Right now, they're just treated as independently. So anyway, what you can see is that this root finder, um, it found the location of the root to within the desired tolerance in 11 evaluations. Uh, and it needed, uh, you know, this default lower limit of 301 terms in the continued fraction iteration. Um, and there's some, a whole bunch of information stored in this object, like the estimated error. Um, so the value of the continued fraction expansion, you can see it got down to 10 to the minus 10. And this is the omega, and this is the, the separation constant, and this is the vector 
for the decomposition. Okay, so the key to being able to um, robustly find the quasi-normal mode frequencies that you're interested in and separation constants and Cs is to have a good guess in the complex plane. And so uh, we, we follow a sequence up in A. So starting at Schwarzschild where we know the separation constant uh, and then we increase the A and march up uh, un until we've gotten to the desired value of spin that you're after. Okay, so all of that is implemented in uh, some other modules. So all of the Schwarzschild stuff is implemented in qnm.schwarzschild. And there's a, an object called a Schwarzschild overtone sequence. Um, so I call it an overtone sequence because if you've looked at these uh, overtones in the complex plane, you know that they asymptotically, they get linearly spaced in frequency as you go up in overtone number. And that means that if you have a few overtones, then you can extrapolate to the location of the next overtone and use that as an initial guess for solving. So that's exactly what the Schwarzschild overtone sequence solver does. Um, so what do we need here? So we need a, uh, we want to get uh, the overtone sequence for gravitational modes. Let's look at the L equals three. Oh, I have these values here at the S at uh, L and N max. So N max here is the overtone number that you want to. Um, and then we need to ask this overtone sequence object to actually do the solving. And it finds a, a vector of omegas. Uh, so each of these corresponds to the zeroth overtone, the first overtone, the second overtone, etc. And if you've, if you've already found an overtone sequence up to some number, then there's a function sequence.extend, which extends it up to um, whatever desired overtone value you want to go to. Now, of course, these also don't change. So these are cached, and this is not something that you have to download. Um, this is just uh, distributed with the in, in, on PyPy or Conda uh, because it's so small. Um, so there's a dictionary that's loaded from, di uh, from disk, and you see that there are all of these quasi-normal mode frequencies and Schwarzschilds that are already loaded on disk. So if you want a particular uh, frequency, uh, so if you want a particular Schwarzschild frequency, um, then you just fetch it from the dict. If it's not in there, then it will try to extend the appropriate overtone sequence up to that point. Okay, so let's say that we wanted to visualize a whole bunch of Schwarzschild quasi-normal mode frequencies in the complex plane. Uh, what we want to do is take this dictionary and call it uh, like a function. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. It, yeah, I called it Schwarz dict, but it's it's uh, it's not a dictionary. It's an object that has a dictionary, and it has a call method that's implemented uh, like a function. So we want to call it with whatever l we're using in this loop, and whatever n we're using in this loop. So this will just get a vector of all of those omegas. As long as I did this right. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot something. So the return value here, we saw it above already. The return value is a tuple of the frequency, the estimated error, and the number of iterations that it took to get there. So we just want the zeroth part of that. So now we can, we can plot all of those and look at all these Schwarzschild frequencies in the complex plane. That's what they look like. There's no M value for these modes. Everything is spherically symmetric. All of the Ms are the same. Okay, and I wanted to point out while we're looking at this plot, here is what's called the algebraically special mode for the two, two uh, harmonic. It's uh, n equals zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, n equals eight overtone. And it's exactly on the negative imaginary axis. And when it's algebraically special, Lever's method, uh, then the Frobenius expansion has a, a finite termination. 
So, um, so Lever's method of this infinite continued fraction assumes that the Frobenius expansion does not terminate. So the Lever's method does not work at algebraically special points. So one potential future enhancement would be um, to detect these algebraically special points and to switch to using a different method at those points. That's not implemented right now. Okay, so I've got to speed up because how, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see how fast we can go through this. So um, the main, to... sorry, say it again. Uh, the five minutes we have, we are already in the final stage with the questions normally. Yeah. Okay. So five minutes. I think we're forget about the questions. Okay, I think we started a little late. <laughs> All right, so the curse spin sequence is kind of the heart of this code is to follow a, um, a sequence of modes, uh, sorry, a, a quasi-normal mode as you smoothly turn the spin up. Um, let me look at my cheat sheet. So we wanna get an object that's a qnm.spinsequence.cur spin sequence and we need to give it a lot of data here. We need to specify which uh, spin weight we're looking at, the uh, L number and the M number, uh, the overtone number, which is really just the inversion number for the radial continued fraction, uh, the maximum value of the spin to go up to, oops. Uh, and then there are some other values that are how large are the steps that it's going to take So these are just controls to, to keep it stepping some reasonable sizes. Um, we need to know how many L's to keep for the, uh, the spectral method. And I'm just going to not allow it to evaluate more than 4,000 terms in a continued fraction. So it takes about 15 seconds to find the sequence from spin zero up to spin 0.9999. Okay, and uh, this is a, I, I chose this uh, particular mode because it has some interesting behavior. Let's look at it in the complex plane. So uh, this is a mode that has what's called a finite termination frequency. It doesn't go down to the real axis. You can see on the, the leftmost plot as A goes towards zero, it, it goes to a, uh, it terminates at a, at a non-zero non real frequency. Uh, imaginary frequency. And it has this kind of loopy behavior in the complex plane, which is not resolved. So all of these values themselves have been solved to the tolerance. It's just the spacing in A has not been done sufficiently finely. But you can use this, um, this solver because it has this data. It can just interpolate for a good guess between these points and then resolve at that point. So here's a value of spin that's not already in the sequence and you can calculate at that new point, and here's the omega a and uh, decomposition. And so this, this, uh, this call method, which is just the parentheses of the function, has an argument store equals false by default, but if you set store equals true, then it'll actually save it. So we can more finely sample in this range of a's um, by just calling it with store equals true a bunch of times, and then if we if we replot the same thing, then we'll see this looping behavior in the frequency as a function of A is now smoothly resolved. Okay, so um, I think that that might be it for the interactive filling in stuff. Everything else is uh, code that I am not going to fill in, which is good because I only have two minutes left. So this is plotting uh, C, the, the, the values of the spherical spheroidal decomposition as a function of A for a given mode. This is the L equals, uh, the L equals four, M equals two, N equals six mode. 
and looking at these C coefficients. So this, this is a log plot in the vertical. So you can see that the slope in L is always a straight line after the peak. So it's always exponentially convergent, but the slope depends on the value of A. So ideally you would want uh, the spectral uh, method to kind of extrapolate and figure out how many Ls are necessary to get to the precision that you want. That's another future enhancement. It's not done right now. All right. So um, uh, the caching is because, you know, all of these numbers should be the same every time you, that you calculate them. Um, so, oh, there is another place to fill in again. So this is the function that we use at the beginning, QNM modes cache, which is actually an object that acts like a function. Um, and you just call it like a function. Uh, uh, I, I gave it a little uh, nickname here, KSC. KSC, let's call it with a particular mode label. This is just uh, Python syntax for uh, taking this tuple and turning it into the arguments of this function. And let's, um, all right, so, so this will get a whole bunch of, uh, of these sequences, these objects, which will return to us, um, which will return to us the frequencies and separation constants. And so once we have these sequences, we can then say, let's pre-compute a whole bunch of values for a plot that I have down below. So let's take this value of A in this list of A's and let's store it. And this is gonna take about 40 seconds. So then I'll, uh, I'll let people ask questions um, and this other cell will run here. Uh, and this is just going to show you how a whole bunch of different L, M, N modes all behave as a function of spin in the complex plane. Oops, except I didn't, I didn't run that cell, so it's not gonna work. All right, anyway, so while that's running, um, let me just say, uh, what are my, my wishes? Uh, things that people could work on on the hack day. Um, so basically, if you go to the issue tracker and open any issue, that's something that you could work on. There can always be better documentation and tests. Uh, I mentioned some of these already. We want spectral expansion to be automatic. We want refinement in A. Sorry, let me rerun this now that I, now that I got the imports in the, in, in the right order. Um, A is not adaptively refined like it should be. Um, one of the difficulties at very high overtone number is to get good heuristics for locating those points. That's something to work on. Uh, algebraically special points. Some modes actually disappear and reappear with A and there's no handling of that right now. Um, and figuring out D omega DA would be nice and using, ar using arbitrary precision would be nice as well. I have no experience with this package called MPMath. All right, so now that this has computed, I can show you. Um, so this is the complex plane again, and every one of these dots is, is one of the quasi-normal modes. At, at A equals zero, all of these M modes are piled on top of each other. And as we raise the value of A, you can see that they're splitting. So there are five here that corresponds to the five modes of L equals two. Going up is overtone number. There are seven here, there are nine here, there are 11 here. So that's L equals two, three, four, five, and so on. And as spin goes up, these quasi-normal modes fly all over the complex plane. So, okay, that's, um, that's all I have. And uh, please fork the code and send pull requests and uh, ask more questions on the Slack channel. So thank you very much, Pio. There is a couple of questions. So I, I see one question and that is, do the included Python packages in the module override the current conduct packages I have installed? Just want to make sure I don't have clashes from my Okay, so I guess if you if uh, if you're working in a conda environment, if you pin a version of a package, then conda will figure that out. Um, I think I put minimum versions in where necessary, but I'm not sure about that. So that if if you found that some pinned version doesn't work, then let me know. Um, 
but you can also just create a new conda environment with nothing else in it except for you know uh except for qnm and it'll just pull in uh numpy and scipy and all the dependencies Great. Uh, so we have another question here from Karol Slusta. Uh, what can you say about the incompleteness of the quasi-normal modes that you compute? I mean, yeah, it's it's not a complete basis, but uh, I'm not claiming that it's a complete basis. I'm not sure if you mean if that's what you mean by completeness or incompleteness, or if you meant like, did I miss some modes? I'm not sure what cut was there. Maybe maybe you can follow up in Slack. Uh, yeah. And uh, perhaps at this point we 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 can conclude. So thanks a lot again. Thank you very great, very informative talk. I, I will have to review it actually myself to kind of understand all the details. And um, let's thank all the speakers. So all the speakers of today. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a very rich program today, uh, and let's meet tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central European summertime. And uh, yeah, take yeah. care. That's good. Good night. Bye. Bye.